Mr. Chairman, we are live on YouTube. Thank you. Welcome to the Joint Judiciary Committee meeting, the third of our three interim meetings, uh, which was originally scheduled as a hybrid meeting with some of our committee in Cheyenne and some on Zoom. Uh, I don't know, I think I may all be on Zoom now, but uh, we'll have the meeting just the same and, and get along well. I uh, want to introduce our staff will be helping us again today. Uh, Brian Fuller, Mary Beth Oatsfall, David Hopkinson, and Danielle Creech. And we appreciate their good support every time out. Uh, it'll go like these Zoom meetings have been going where we uh, invite the witnesses into the room, into the Zoom room, and then they'll identify themselves and their affiliation if they have one and give their testimony and direct their comments through the chair as always. Uh, committee, use your blue hands if you want to be uh, recognized. Uh, if we have votes today, final votes on whether to sponsor bills, of course, those will be taken as a roll call and it'll, uh, a bill will need to pass both bodies by a majority to move on to the session in January. So any questions committee out there? Good morning to you. Welcome. And Anything before we get started? Good to see you all. And I'm sorry we couldn't have done it more in person, but uh, this will be good nonetheless. So I'll call the meeting to order. And if the secretary would call the roll. Senator Insalmi Bell. Present. Senator Bonner. Here. Senator Cox. Here. Senator Mosslater. Here. Representative Burlingame. Here. Representative Gray. Here. Representative Jennings. Here. Representative Gray. Here. Representative Pelkey. Here. Representative Ponat. Here. Representative Salazar. Here. Representative Stitt. Here. Representative Washington. Here. Co-Chairman Nethercott. Excused. Co-Chairman Kirkwright. Here. We need to approve the minutes from the last meeting. I don't know that uh, they're on the agenda. They're not on the agenda that I have, but they were distributed on the 30th of September. So I assume people have looked at them and uh, have an opinion on them. So the chair would entertain it. Motion to approve the minutes, approved, uh, moved by Pelkey, seconded by An Senator Anselmi Dalton. Any discussion on the minutes? Uh, we could do this by a raising of hands. All in favor of approval of the minutes from the August meeting, please raise your hands. I believe that is unanimous, uh, but anyone opposed, raise your hand. Okay, the meeting from the August, meeting minutes from August are approved. Move on to our first topic, which involves public records and meetings. And we'll go to our staff to introduce the topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. David Hopkinson with the Legislative Service Office. Um, there are three bills before the committee this morning. Uh, I will uh, be discussing the first 121 LSO 213. Mr. Fuller will take on the next two uh, as we proceed. Uh, just a brief introduction of this bill draft. Uh, again, 21 LSO 213 working draft 0 0.2. Uh, this was presented to the committee at the August meeting by Senator Koss. Uh, all this bill draft is fairly straightforward. It's uh, it provides another reason for a governing body of an agency to go into executive session. Um, the committee can see that on page two of the bill draft lines two through four is, is really what the bill does, uh, creating that new paragraph 12, uh, providing that uh, the committee, or uh, excuse me, an agency, uh, <clears throat> governing body of an agency could go into executive session. 
to consider, discuss, and conduct safety and security planning that, if disclosed, would pose a threat to the safety of life or property. Uh, further below on line 12, it is simply a conforming amendment. And in section two, this draft would take effect or this bill would take effect immediately. Uh, with that, I would stand for any questions that the committee may have on this bill draft. Any questions for Mr. Hopkinson? Any questions? I'm not seeing none. Thank you, David. Is there anyone uh, in the live audience or in the virtual audience wishes to speak to the bill? Any public comment? Mr. Chairman, I think we have some public comment, but I'm not sure on what bill draft. So should we go ahead and um, add Dickie Shaner and the rest of the people in the waiting room? Um, that would be um, Shannon Anderson, uh, Byron over COVID, it looks like Brian Farmer, and Jonathan Downey. Um, I don't think he signed up for this topic, but we might um, just go ahead and get them so that they're all in. Okay, great. We'll wait just a moment while you do that. Mr. Chairman, it looks like everyone has been admitted, so uh, we might just uh, ask them if they have comments on this particular bill draft. Okay, very good. So, folks, I don't know if you were uh, listening out there. Presumably you would, but we've begun the discussion on the public meetings executive sessions for security plans bill, which is draft 0213. And Ms. Tropkinson presented the bill to us. Do any of you have comments on this bill, if you would? Uh, raise your hand or your blue hand or some way flag me down so I can call on you. Mr. Farmer, welcome. And it's the same old stuff, Mr. Farmer, you know about uh, if you'd identify yourself and your affiliation and uh, direct your comments to the chair and we're happy to hear from you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brian Farmer from Wyoming School Boards Association. And just uh, want to thank Senator Cost for bringing this forward. Thank you to the committee for consideration of this bill. Uh, this is absolutely uh, something that we support. Uh, the opportunity to um, address those safety and security needs of our public schools uh, is a paramount concern to, to our members. Um, wanting to be sure that uh, when necessary, they take advantage of those opportunities uh, to, uh, to have uh, private discussions that uh, the contents wouldn't be available to those who might be intent on doing harm to members of uh, the school or school district. So uh, we know that some other states uh, have done so, uh, something similar um, and we don't anticipate that this would be something uh, that would necessarily be used on a frequent basis, but it does provide an option for those instances where it might be necessary. So with that, I would ask you for your favorable consideration of this bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. Any questions for Mr. Farmer? Representative Burlingame. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks, Mr. Farmer. Um, yeah, my question is just about how the school board association um, spells out the parameters of this. I don't know if you were familiar with this, but this rule was invoked when um, the school board had a, a committee that met to discuss um, whether or not to keep a book in the school or out of the school. So that committee met 
And then uh, in order to determine their um, findings, they went into executive session. And at the time, the newspaper reporter, the, the Tribune Eagle here, um, appealed the decision, right, saying, hey, I don't think that this falls under um, executive session rules. And she was told that it did because it was to consider, discuss, and conduct safety and security planning. I, I failed to see how that fit under those parameters, right? That seemed very clearly like they were discussing whether a book would or would not stay on the shelves, but this is the rule that they invoked. So I guess I wanna hear from you how, how you're going to let your members know what the parameters are of this, and then maybe what, what's, what's the, um, what happens when they violate that? Thank you. Mr. Farmer. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I appreciate the question. I would certainly point out that there is no language similar to this uh, in existing statute. So um, I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, the case that you might be referring to um, out, out of Laramie 1. Um, there are two instances um, when a, um, a board might go into uh, executive session for safety and security discussions presently. One would be if their attorney is present. Uh, so if they are receiving legal advice, um, then they may go into executive session. And so, um, again, I'm not familiar with the instant uh, that you uh, discussed. Um, but if an attorney was present, uh, then you can um, uh, do that. Now, in our larger communities, that's an easy thing to do. You can have your attorney uh, just come down from their office and be present for a school board meeting. Uh, but even in Laramie um, or, uh, or Green River, um, their uh, council, um, their home office of their council is in Cheyenne. Um, Mr. Copenhaver, who represents approximately 20 of our school districts in the state, can't be at all of their uh, school board meetings. So it's not always practical uh, that you have uh, an attorney present. Um, and and uh, it, it may be only those instances where you know you have a, a legal issue to discuss. The second occasion where a board may, under present law, talk about uh, school safety and security is when a uh, police chief uh, sheriff uh, is present uh, and they discuss something um, with those certain law enforcement officers. Now, again, the present law requires certain people to be in the room. And in some communities that may be possible, uh, but in others, it's not always possible. And, and frankly, it may not be um, necessary uh, if you were talking about um, uh, evacuation routes uh, to have uh, uh, a police chief or something like that uh, present. Um, now, uh, I would say um, what we would do toward training is I think that in, in the discussion of this present uh, statute, it talks about when um, uh, there is a threat to, um, to, to life or uh, I can't remember, I don't have that exactly in front of me, um, uh, property I think it is, but um, pose a threat to safety of life or property. And so uh, again, that would have to be an element of a, a board calling executive session under this present law. And I would agree with you um, that a discussion about a textbook and whether or not that's appropriate uh, would be uh, had um, in executive session. Um, I would also say, again, I'm not familiar with your situation, um, but it is possible that uh, it may have been a, um, a, a public committee or a committee of uh, staff and perhaps um, one or two or three board members were a part of that committee uh, in that case, it would not have fallen under the Public Meetings Act because it wouldn't have been a meeting of a governing body. Um, so if you have uh, faculty or staff or uh, something uh, where they're making a recommendation that would then go before a school board, um, that is not a public meeting under the, the current Wyoming statute's definition. Uh, so I think um, it, it would really depend on some factors that I'm not really familiar with, but we do um, a fair amount of training around the public records and the public meetings laws for our members um, and, and help them to answer uh, questions that come up. And it's very important to us that we uh, refer them to their legal counsel, um, their local legal counsel, 
when they have a specific question and they say, you know, this is going on and uh, we want to know, should we um, do this in executive session or, or not? Um, we'll, we'll be happy to talk with them about what the law says, but they have to uh, get their legal advice from their attorneys. Uh, and I guess the last thing that I would say about that, your question of what would uh, a member of the public or, or someone else do, um, it, it is currently, uh, I believe, a civil penalty for uh, a violation of the statute. And so um, I think any member of the public could certainly refer that to their uh, local prosecutor. Um, they could uh, have a member of their uh, attorney, uh, you know, their local attorney, their, 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 uh, their own counsel, uh, bring the matter up uh, with the board or with the district. Um, and we encourage transparency with our governing bodies. They're, they're elected officials uh, just like you are. Um, and the public um, is going to hold them accountable for the job that they do. Uh, and so it generally is best that you do uh, as much of the public business in the public as, as possible. And um, uh, I think uh, it, it's uh, important to make sure people are not uh, misinterpreting or taking advantage of opportunities uh, in an instance where it's not a threat to safety of life uh, or property. I don't think this allows for uh, executive session. Any further questions for Mr. Farmer? Taking public comment on Bill 213. Okay, thank you, Mr. Farmer. Would anyone else in the audience like to testify on the bill? Anyone else? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Coven. I missed that, Mary Beth. Representative Jennings has his blue hand up. Yes, I do see that. Representative Jennings, let's let's go to you and then we'll get to Ms. Trotacoven. Representative. Representative Jennings. Representative Jennings. I, I am not hearing you, either muted or unmuted. I couldn't hear what you were saying. Okay, how about there you go. Now? Very well, good. For Mr. Farmer, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I just, as uh, Representative Burlingame was bringing that out, I, I thought of a scenario that I'm, I'm just a little bit curious about. So let's say it was something like, uh, video surveillance and you you could uh, say you'd wanted to discuss that because of safety or um, life and property but I also see you know there's also it seems like there could be a question of civil rights to the where where you put those cameras or just a for instance there how, how would you determine whether or not that was um, to be done in an executive session or it, it seems like there's two things being handled in some of those things. So if he could answer how you would look at that, how that under this statute. Mr. Farmer. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I think it's a complex question that would uh, really be uh, addressed on a case by case situation, uh, but there certainly are best practices um, so if you are looking at, for example, um, where to place a camera, um, you can certainly take shots, uh, photographs or uh, video shots from where the camera would be placed, uh, what it might capture um, and, and do that um, without individuals present. Um, the, the school would certainly have that opportunity or that option for uh, looking at that. Um, there would be uh, folks uh, such as Mr. Oda Coven uh, or any of the individuals he represent that might also have input to say, hey, um, you know, uh, we, we've been getting uh, tips from our SRO that um, uh, there's marijuana uh, that's being sold under the stairwell. And so you might consider putting a camera uh, in that location. Now, if uh, it ever comes to observing individuals, uh, the software does have the ability to blur out uh, faces, 
um, or uh, things that would make uh, images so that an individual's likeness um, is not uh, available. And so that, that um, imaging could be uh, blurred to protect privacy of students. Certainly that may be required under FERPA, uh, the, the Federal Education Privacy Rights Act. Um, or or, uh, or uh, if you had other laws that might require the protection of identification or even simply a safety consideration um, uh, if uh, the law enforcement was working with someone that they might have considered to be uh, a confidential informant of some sort um, and, and those kinds of things needed to be blurred out. So I think the technology allows for the protection of uh, individual identities by blurring of images for anything that might need to be viewed. And if you're simply looking at placement, you can do that without uh, looking directly at individuals. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee of Mr. Farmer? Yeah, I don't see any blue hands. So let's move to Mr. Odekoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Byron Odekoven, the Executive Director for the Wyoming Sheriffs and Chiefs. Greetings from the in-home office at the ranch at minus four degrees and sunshine this morning. So I'm glad not to be uh, traveling on the road. There are some days a little advantage to being remote. Um, uh, rising this morning to offer support for the bill and kind of bring the discussion back to the basics, if I may. And that is that the bill is designed to allow for executive session to discuss security and safety. Um, so for us that came to light when a sheriff's office wished to visit with the school district um, and there was having concern over whether or not an executive session was appropriate and the media wanted to know what the discussion was about when it turned out to clearly be about safety and security, threats to the building, life and liberty uh, that was being discussed and there was no statutory authorization for that um, discussion. Uh, to help address a question uh, in terms of the book, uh, no, I would agree that would be, um, I would sense that would not be a law enforcement question, the proper use of a book within a facility, I'm guessing. Uh, so we would not be initiating a safety and security discussion um, as described. Having said that, there are other manuals on how to blow things up or how to do all kinds of things that may be of concern if that was to be questioned to be placed in the library. Uh, certainly that would be part of a discussion. In terms of the placement of the cameras, um, let me remind uh, the committee that in general, the Supreme Court has addressed well the placement of cameras within public facilities and public places and where they cannot be within those public places, especially for uh, safety and security. So I think that is well crafted within the Supreme Court uh, world and this bill would not alter or change that. It merely allows for an executive session to discuss some of those issues and concerns. So rising in support of the bill, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for Mr. Odekoven? Committee, any questions? Right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Thank you. Would sir. anyone else in the public like to speak to this bill? Anyone else? Okay, I'm not seeing any other public comment, so I believe I'll close public comment and bring the bill before the committee. Committee, what is your pleasure? Move the bill. Second. Moved by Pinal, seconded by Von Flater. Is there any uh, suggestions for amendments, committee? Senator Boner. Senator Boner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. My space bar wasn't working there. It's uh, more of a question, I guess, for uh, Senator Cost or maybe the members of the staff. I'm just looking at the current exemptions for or reasons for uh, executive session. And it seems like there's already one in there. The very first one under 16-4-405 uh, talk about if basically if you have a member of law enforcement, you're uh, present and you're talking about uh, 
a threat to the security of public or private property or the public's right to access that so that's already covered. So I'm just wondering how that provision would interact with the new uh, paragraph uh, 12 there. Uh, just making sure that our basis cover it seems to me that maybe that first uh, paragraph little I would not be necessary. This would be more encompassing of uh, the uh, areas covered in, in that first paragraph. So just a, a, I guess more of a technical question than anything. Does anyone want to respond to Senator Boner? Senator Cost? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> In order for the um, executive session to take place, according to the first one, it would have to be if the law enforcement is present. If those types of articles, uh, discussions came up between, the, say, the uh, tech coordinator and the board trying to discuss on um, the in infrastructure of a firewall or purchasing of certain uh, lockouts for entrances to the buildings and all, they would need to get the police present before they could discuss that in those instances. So this just opens it up for those specific times when there could be a threat to the safety or the property and uh, allows for that freedom to not, okay, I got to go get our lawyer or I've got to get our policeman to be able to follow through with it. Um, the best part about the way it was amended to what we currently see in 12 is that the, um, lobbyists for the press wrote this up and fully supported it. Uh, so uh, that made it even better than it was before. It, it just opens a little more freedom to be able to discuss those real sensitive areas. It is not intended for just any time you want to talk about cameras or you want to talk about uh, situations such as been brought up a book or anything like that has really nothing to do with it. It's when it really is directly related to the security of the people in the buildings. How are you going to get your kids out when there's an, um, uh, some kind of a threat? How are you going to make sure you lock down a building so that the people who may be um, trying to, uh, I guess the best way to say it is be violent towards this particular building or whatever have less of a chance of knowing exactly what you're doing. Thank you, Senator. Any further suggestions or not further, any suggestions for amendments to the bill? Any discussion of the bill? Any discussion? Call a question. Call a question has been called for. Uh, Mary Beth, would you please call the roll? Mr. Chairman, this is a roll call vote on 21 LSO uh, 213 version 2 with no amendments. Senator Anselmi Hall. Aye. Senator Bonner. Aye. Senator Cost. Aye. Senator Montflater. Aye. Representative Burlingame. Aye. Representative Gray? Aye. Representative Jennings? Aye. Representative Kelly? Aye. Representative Ponell? Aye. Representative Salazar? Aye. Representative Stitt? Aye. Representative Washington? I'll take that as an aye. Just not. Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, that passes. Okay, the bill is unanimous in both bodies. So, uh, bill draft 0213 moves on to the session. We'll move now to our next bill and Mr. Fuller has the explanation. 
Yeah, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Brian Fuller, LSO, you should have 21 LSO 162 draft 0.5 in front of you. Um, this is 3-03 in the meeting materials. Um, in reviewing the Public Records Act and, and specifically the exemptions to those at the last meeting, um, the committee adopted a motion for a bill draft um, to address records requests for public records that may be held uh, by more than one governmental entity. This bill draft clarifies um, to whom public records requests should be made when, uh, when multiple governmental entities hold that particular public record. So starting in on the bill on page two, line one, this inserts a new subsection in 16.4202 to state that requests for public records where the public records or copies of those records are held by more than one governmental entity, um, the public records request shall be made to the governmental entity from which the public record originated. And then on line five, a new sentence that just provides that a governmental entity that receives a request for public records um, that originate from another governmental entity must notify the applicant within seven business days from the date of acknowledged receipt of the request and must forward the request to the governmental entity holding the original records thought for inspection um, if that's known. And then Mr. Chairman, the staff comment on page two just notes that current law provides that if a governmental entity um, doesn't have or control a, a public record, it must provide the name and contact information of the appropriate designated public records person if known. Um, and then this act on page three would be effective on July 1st. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer questions about the bill draft. Any questions for Mr. Fuller? Any questions? Seeing none, we'll move to the public comment. Oh, just a moment, Senator Von Flader. Mr. Fuller, how would they know that they forwarded this on to the other uh, entity, the other governmental entity? Mr. Chairman, Senator Von Flader, are you, are you referring to the applicant for those records? Right, they applied to this government entity governmental entity and they didn't have it. So they moved it on to, or they, within seven days, they notified the applicant and then they moved it on to the other one. And isn't there a time limit on the other entity saying we received it and starts the clock? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Senator Von Flader, under, under current law, so, so the distinction would be right now, if, if, a, if I make a request to an agency and the agency doesn't have um, that record, but knows who does, um, they have to notify the applicant that they don't have it. Um, and, and then they also have to give the, the name of the agency that does have it and that agency's designated public records person. Um, there, there's nothing that states that, um, that they have to forward the request to, um, to that new agency. Under the language in this bill draft, if they know where that is, they have to notify the applicant and then forward it. Um, in terms of the language, you, you know, certainly there could be a, a tweak to make clear that, um, that the notice to the applicant has to include notice that the request is being forwarded to, to the agency from which the record originated. Senator Von Flader. So, and I don't know this, but Mr. Fuller, within so many days they have to notify or they have to give the records over to this other person. Or, so the applicant, be back when you used to give the address and the contact person of the other entity, I don't have it, I'm sending you over to this other person. The applicant would know then that they, um, when they applied, they know that would start the clock. How would they know this would start the clock on, um, because they're gonna forward it. It may be forwarded today, it may be forwarded last week, it may be forwarded 12 days from now, but how would they know that it's forwarded? Mr. Fowler. 
Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Von Flader, at, at least in terms of this duplicate records language, you, you know, that's that's a fair question. You know, I, I would note in, in 16.4.202 that the, the language that was inserted a couple of years ago when the Public Records Act was amended um, just flatly states that all public records shall be released not later than 30 calendar days from the date of acknowledged receipt of the request, um, unless good cause um, exists preventing release. And um, and if good and good cause isn't necessarily specified, you know, so it would be a question whether you know forwarding a request would would constitute good cause. Um, but but right now the way the language reads is you would have 30 days from from that re receipt of the request to provide those records. All right, we have uh, if Senator Von Flader, and if you're Good for the moment, we'll go to Representative Stiff. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fuller, let me, I just wanna make sure I understand what this language does. If you have two agencies, say the city, a city uh, that is communicating with the Department of Environmental Quality and there's correspondence going back and forth between the two of them. So hypothetically speaking, let's imagine that the department, that the abandoned mine lands division of the Department of Environmental Equality gave four and a half million dollars to a city in Southwest Wyoming. And let's imagine hypothetically speaking that the city just spent the money and never asked permission or approval from DEQ and DEQ is unhappy about it, hypothetically speaking. And let's imagine the letters that go from the city to DEQ are all positive and upbeat and saying how wonderful this is, but the letters coming back from DEQ say, hey, you're violating the law and you're gonna to have to reimburse these funds and et cetera. So if a citizen asked for correspondence and they directed their request to the city under this law, wouldn't the city produce just its side of the correspondence because the other side of the correspondence coming from DEQ did not originate with the city? Mr. Fuller. Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith, um, I think two things would happen. Um, first, in direct response to your question, um, the the in your in your hypothetical situation, the city would only, the way the language reads, only need to provide the link, provide the correspondence it sent to DEQ. Um, but the, the city must also, because it has correspondence that may not be an original copy, um, you know, would have to forward that to DEQ and notify the applicant. Representative Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fuller, uh, I think everybody knows how I feel about this. Is I, I think the ink is almost dry on this bill. Could you remind us uh, or give us uh, examples of what we're trying to fix here? I mean, what this, this bill has barely been in place a year. Are there a bunch of people lining up and saying, boy, we sure need to fix this? I mean, could you could you remind me how we got to this point of actually needing to fiddle with this part of the statute? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fuller. Mr. Chairman, Representative Jennings, my, my recollection of the, the August meeting, this was a, a motion. Um, I don't have exactly who, I don't recall specifically who made it. Um, I think it may have been the, the, the co-chairman um, who made the motion, um, but in terms of, you know, those, those matters, I'm, I'm not privy to them um, and would respectfully defer to, to those who may be, who, who, um, who are seeking the bill draft. Representative Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question to Mr. Fuller is, Sometimes these agencies that are the originator or hold the original are not going to be state agencies. They may be out of the state or federal government. And so I'm assuming that then their state laws or the federal regulations kick in at that point. And this bill doesn't put any onus burden on, on an agency from out of state, correct? Mr. Fuller? Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Washett, uh, you know, I think by using the term governmental entity, it, it would only apply to records um, that, that originate from another 
governmental entity as defined in this act. And that would be the state of Wyoming, an agency, political subdivision, or state institution of Wyoming. Thank you. Okay. Representative Stith, are you, you still have a question or? Well, I apologize. No, I meant to take my hand down. Sorry. Okay, good. Any other questions for Mr. Fuller and, and Representative Jennings? I think we'll get to some of your question before we're done here with the uh, public testimony. Okay, I know that uh, Chief of Staff Shaner wants to speak to this from the public, so we'll call on him. Mr. Shaner. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Let's see, um, there we go. All right, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having me here this morning. Uh, as you stated, my name is Dickie Shaner. I'm with the Department of Education and appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, this bill in front of you entitled Request for Duplicated Records. It's, um, it's particularly germane to a request that we received uh, end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And what I'd like to do, Mr. Chairman, is just briefly walk you through the, the primary facts of that request we received and the related provisions of the public records law. So uh, Mr. Chairman, in short, what we struggled with was um, the request brought into conflict our efforts to follow the letter of the law, uh, our commitment to government transparency, and our legal obligation to protect the safety of individuals who are subjects of the request. The issue came down to how we comply with the request and at the same time protect the life and physical safety of individuals whose names were part of the request, which is something that the public records law contemplates custodians like us doing. Uh, so in late 2019, we received a records request for the names, positions, and salaries of all local school district employees in the state. So not Department of Ed, but local school districts around the state. Uh, and after discussing that request with the requester, uh, we agreed upon producing the positions and salaries without the names. Uh, and that's something that we regularly produce. Uh, however, subsequent to that production, the requester again asked for the names associated with those positions and salaries. And so under the public records law, the Department of Education is a custodian of those records. They are public records, uh, and therefore we have an obligation to produce them unless an exception to that disclosure applies. And so when you read deeper into that public records law, uh, specifically 16-4-203B, Six, the law contemplates the custodian denying access to records that would be, quote, contrary to the public interest. And one of the examples um, that might meet that would be a situation where the disclosure of a record endangers the life or physical safety of an individual. And it's that exception of protecting the life and physical safety of individuals that was really at the center uh, of our deliberations related to this records request. Eventually, what we ended up doing was developing a process where we asked for an extension of time to respond from the requester uh, to give school districts the opportunity to share with us any of their employees who uh, would be endangered by release of their name and to give us the, the reason why. And most of the issues were related to domestic violence situations and uh, sensitive adoptions. And so after going through this process with districts, we received requests from 14 school districts uh, with a total of about 43 names that uh, were withheld from this disclosure. And to give you some context, the amount of information that we did provide to the requester was approximately 23,000 school district employee names, positions, and salaries. So um, out of that 23,000, less than 50 names uh, were withheld under this, this exception to uh, the disclosure requirement. So in summary, Mr. Chairman, it was difficult to develop a process to protect the safety of employees who are not Department of Education employees. 
Uh, we don't know the individual circumstances of local school district employees. Uh, and therefore, it's the opinion of the state superintendent that it would make more sense um, that if uh, names are to be produced, that the local school districts who are actually their employer be the ones charged with producing the names and then therefore withholding those names uh, that may be endangered by disclosure. And I think that's what you're trying to get at with this duplicated records bill. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to uh, speak to our situation and happy to answer any questions that may um, come from the committee. Thank you, Mr. Shaner. Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Shaner, I perhaps I'm just not following your example very well. If someone's requesting the name, the position and the salary of an employee from the Department of Education and they're entitled to get that information from the school district anyway, I don't understand the public's threat to safety. I mean, in other words, the fact that you work for the Department of Education is not a secret. I don't, I don't understand, I guess I'm confused as to where the threat to public safety was in that. Representative Stith, you, you've gone off the audio for a moment. So I, I apologize. I'll just keep it one question at a time. So can you help me with that example? I don't quite understand the basis for withholding names. Mr. Sure. Shaner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you, Representative Stith. Um, so the request was not for names of Department of Education employees. It was requests for names of local school district employees from the Department of Education. So um, there was a district court case in Laramie County in 2011 where Laramie County School District number one uh, and some newspapers had a lawsuit. The district court ruled that the names uh, in fact are public records and need to be produced by the school district. What, what made this situation unique is that this was a request of the Department of Ed to provide names of employees of local school districts and where we ran into um, an issue was the statute asks that we protect the life or physical safety of any individual um, whose name is being requested. But we don't have, at the Department of Ed, we don't have the individual circumstance of those employees because they're not our employees, they're local district employees. So we had to figure out a process to uh, reach out to school districts ask them if they had any employees who may be endangered by release of their names, submit those names to us with the reason why. And then when we produced our records, we withheld those names based on what the local school district said. So we were kind of put in a situation where we were asked to um, protect the, the circumstances of individuals who are not our employees. Madam Co-Chairman. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, I mean, to help kind of answer Representative Stitt's question, I mean, the issue is the public records request is directed to a custodian that has the records, but they're not necessarily the agency that is truly the custodian of the record and may not be the agency that would be able to determine if an exception applies or if there's a public policy concern regarding those records. So whereas they are, they have them, they're not responsible for the information within them necessarily. And so the question becomes who should be making those decisions about to, to honor or um, you know to grant or deny the public records request should it be the actual producers of the record or should it just be somebody who has them uh, maybe whether regardless of whether or not they should have them or not and so this kind of puts the onus for production of the record on the entity that produced the record and is in the greater position to arguably, you know, deny or grant the request and or defend against any kind of public policy concerns 
that may or may not exist. Representative Stith. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. So for Mr. Shainer, could you help me with an example? So for example, let's imagine we have a school superintendent who is does not have a certificate to teach K through 12 in Wyoming, which would should disqualify him from being a superintendent. Public doesn't know that. The school district doesn't really isn't thrilled about disclosing that information. So they give those sensitive documents off to their outside lawyer. Uh, and let's imagine also you've got an employment contract for the same superintendent with a base salary of $160,000, uh, but there's an exhibit or a schedule to it that also says he gets an extra $700 a month as a vehicle allowance, another $1,000 a month as a housing allowance. A member of the public asks the school to, and let's imagine that this information is both with the school district, but the Department of Education also has a copy of the relevant documents. So wouldn't this bill create a sole source of information so that if a member of the public made a request for the school superintendent's contract and made a request for other relevant records and the school district uh, produces say the contract but not the exhibit showing the fringe benefits and just forgets or fails to produce the information about the fact that the teacher, the superintendent is not qualified to teach in Wyoming, uh, don't you have a, but the Department of Education has that problem. Don't, doesn't that create the potential that you would have these public records in the possession of the Department of Education, but the Department of Education would never produce those in response to any request because those documents didn't originate with the doc Department of Education. Mr. Shainer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you to, to Representative Stitt. Uh, you know, we, um, we aren't entirely clear what the implications of the, the term originate would be in this draft bill. Um, and so really what I'm speaking to today is what Senator Nethercott articulated, and that is simply that there is a provision in the public records law right now that asks any custodian of a record to protect the life and safety of someone whose name may be disclosed, um, regardless of whether that individual comes in contact with the custodian. And so that's the issue we're wrestling with is um, trying to figure out how we do that when we don't have any idea about the individual circumstances of those employees. So it's a pretty narrow focus of, of, of our concern and, and what we're trying to um, share with you uh, as an issue based off this request. So uh, in, terms of, in terms of that particular fact pattern that, that you shared, I, I couldn't speak to whether uh, what, the, what this proposed legislation might result in related to that hypothetical. Representative Stith. I apologize, let me take my hand down. Good enough. Representative Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Shainer. But in the middle of all this, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you resolved that by asking the the originator of the documents to send you that information so that you did resolve this and you you did give uh, 23,000 records and you withheld the, the proper ones. Am, am I misunderstanding that? So in a way, this actually did work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shainer. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Jennings, thank you. I, I think we did the best we could uh, in an issue of, of first impression for us. Um, however, I don't know what would happen next um, if, in fact, the requester disputed those, those records that were withheld, um, and if it had to go in front of a judge or the ombudsman, uh, would it be each individual school district that had to appear in, in Laramie District Court and go into an in-camera uh, discussion and present a factual basis? Um, so I think there are a lot of unanswered questions for how this process would evolve. Um, going forward if it were walked out more. Uh, so I think we came up with a, a solution that uh, at least for right now works, uh, but it hasn't been, been tested to its, its ultimate limits yet. And I think it will, uh, again, we're removing the employer from um, the, the direct responsibility over its employees and putting, you know, the state agency into the middle of it. So um, I think there's, 
perhaps a way that we could to put the onus on the local school district to be in charge of protecting the safety related to disclosures of records related to their employees. Back to Representative Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But I think that's kind of what I'm what I'm grappling with or having a little trouble with. You said this hasn't been tested and walked all the way out, and yet we're gonna we're gonna change this. And we've already pointed out that there might be as big or bigger problems with what we're what we're now talking about here. Do you see that there could be issues in this that would have to be walked out and tested? I mean, it seems to me like that you've got a good case. We need to find out. We need to walk that forward and test it and see how that would play out before we before we go to the next possible solution. Does that make sense, Mr. Shane? Mr. Shaner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, Representative Jennings. Yeah, again, I, I can't speak to this, this bill in terms of what the, the word originating will do uh, to the specific situation that we had. Um, all I'm speaking to is um, we, the, the superintendent believes it would be more appropriate um, to place the responsibility of protecting the life and safety of an employee whose name is to be disclosed on that employee's employer and not on a state agency that's removed from that employee. Uh, and like I said, we came up with a, situ a, a process um, to deal with the situation the best we could. Uh, but I, I think that there's, there's probably a better way to do it in keeping that records request tied to the employer of that employee. Representative Jennings. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I'll just one, one brief. So when you receive this information, like the first time from the originator, is there a method of, of saying to that, or maybe it's already being done that says, um, listen, we're flagging this person because there is some question mark here as to their life and safety if their name is disclosed. It, it, I mean, how you, I see that you went back and talked to those, but would there, could there be a mechanism to, when you're re compiling this information, could you go back to those 48 districts and say, you know, flag anything here that, that risks life or limb? Mr. Shaner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Jennings, I think that that's um, certainly a possible uh, process to put in place. Co-Chairman Nethercott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I think one of the concerns here, can you hear me? Is that um, there's no obligation to create records, right? Or to go get them. And so I think that's the challenge that the Department of Education found itself in, and it went outside of its statutory requirements, I think, under the Public Records Act in that scenario, to take the time to accumulate that data which was really probably outside of their statutory requirements as I indicated. And it really shifted the burden of who should be producing the accurate data from the school district who actually employs those individuals and can state these actually are our current employees to the Department of Education. And I think that it's also easy to just look at it in this space of the Department of Education and school districts, but we're talking about all public entities. And so back to kind of some of Representative Stitt's concern when we create this sole source and that there's an inference that that might be have a negative impact. And I think that deserves further discussion. But I also think it puts the burden on the appropriate entity rather than, you know, a shell game of who should be responsible for producing information. It also can create duplicate, information, duplicate efforts. Let's say, for example, on the Department of Education's piece, Public records request goes to the Department of Education. It also goes to all of the school districts across the state. Well, well now what? Who should be doing what when should the school district throw its hands up um, because the Department of Education is going to do this, but they've got other things to do? Should the Department of Education do it? Five, five of the school districts choose to, the Department of Education chooses to. And we're talking about state resources and government entity resources. So we're also creating this burden that doesn't exist in statute of which they could just reject. And again, I'm not necessarily talking about schools in all of this scenario, but they serve somewhat as an example. 
to, to not comply with the request. Well, we thought someone else was doing it. Well, we thought they were doing it. And so it's the shifting burdens um, that I think could be an unintended consequence by not having the sole source. So for representative, representative Stitt's example, where he wants to know the superintendent's contract and the school district refuses to comply, well, you know immediately that the school district refuses to comply. And there are now statutory steps for which you can plan that out to get that fact to be my position that a failure to turn that document over is a fairly clear violation of the act. And therefore, a remedy can be sought much faster than trying to seek out other sources of that data. So there are some benefits of potentially having the buck stop in one place and that buck be the creator and steward and or custodian of the document. So just some things to consider about that. Cindra and Selmy Dalton, at one time you had your blue hand up. Do you still have a question? No, I think I'll just continue listening. Sorry, thanks. I took it down. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have a question for Mr. Shaner? Or Mr. Shaner, do you have any more comments? Senator Boner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. just want to make sure uh, I understand and looking at this uh, last sentence, especially, it seems like um, if somebody does receive a request that uh, does not, it, and they're not the originator of the document, they're required to forward it, it on uh, to the actual originator of the document. And this, in my mind, doesn't uh, it ensures that the appropriate agency is going to get the, the request and presumably respond to it. Uh, I just don't see if, uh, you know, the only concern I would have with this bill, if it somehow presents some sort of hurdle to uh, public access to information, it seems like if anything, it, it makes it better because you're going to uh, ultimately the originator of the documents going to get the request and they're going to uh, hopefully respond to it. Um, so just want to make sure with that last sentence that Mr. Shaner that say if we have the situation repeat itself, it's not going to prevent anybody from getting information that they want about school district employees. Um, it's just going to sort of uh, almost streamline the process. And, and if you get the same request, you're just going to forward it on to the school districts on behalf of the requester. Is that uh, correct? Mr. Shaner. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you to Senator Boner. Uh, again, Senator, we, we don't um, have a position on this bill. Um, we have not um, had the opportunity to really explore all the different implications uh, of what this term origination would be. Um, I'm here today to explain the situation that, that we're in and also um, appreciate the sentiment of, of what I believe that this bill is trying to accomplish. Uh, and that is not charging a state agency with the responsibility to protect uh, the life and safety of someone who is not our employee, uh, because it's just a, it's a it's not a, a practical or um, good way to um, administer that that provision of the public records law. Representative Burlingame. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks, Mr. Shaner, for joining us today. Yeah, my, my question is super straightforward, and I don't know if it's in your purview, but if the, for instance, the Department of Education, if you house all 48 of those records and the record request comes to you, is it your understanding, if we pass this bill, that you would be able to say, as the Department of Education, we're not the originator, right? Each individual 48 schools or districts are the originators. But since we have it all together collated in one spot, we can pass it along rather than ask every 48 of them to, to bring it in. Does it allow for that flexibility or is it your understanding that because of the safety issue that you need to um, at, at every instance pass it forward to the school, to the originating site? Mr. Shaner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, Representative Burlingame, uh, good question. And um, we, uh, we bounced it around um, some of our team here, and we're not sure whether we would be an originator or not uh, in terms of these personnel records, because we are requesting them from districts that these names and salaries and positions be submitted to us, which is, again, why I can't speak to what the implications of um, that word would be if put into practice. 
Um, what I will say is we regularly produce the um, positions and salaries of every school district in the state, um, no, no issue. The issue was the fact that disclosing with that information the name as well triggered that duty and statute for us to protect the life uh, and uh, personal safety of individuals that we had no, no contact with or no understanding of their individual circumstances. So uh, we had to do this uh, informal survey request of districts to ask if they would do that due diligence for their employees, share that with us and make requests on whether to um, withhold a name based on that, that exception. So for us, I, I guess I would, I would summarize for us that if the name issue was really the issue. It wasn't any of the other records. Those are produced regularly. It was the, the name issue triggered that safety exception. Uh, and we were in a precarious situation uh, in trying to manage that. Representative Burlingame, are you you're caught up? Representative Stith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shannon, and I'm sorry that I'm just slow on the uptake here, but can you give me an example of when some, a school district employee's name would not be disclosable to the public? I mean, I just, I'm having trouble understanding the situation there. I mean, I understand if I'm an employee I may not want, for example, an abusive ex-spouse to know that I'm working for the school district in Evanston, for example, but if I'm a government employee, my identity is not a secret. I don't, I guess I'm just not understanding the situation where it's legitimate to withhold the identity of government employees. I mean, we don't have secret government employees, do we? Mr. Shaner. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you, Representative Stith. So Representative, um, what we did, if you look at the uh, law, 16.4.203.B.6, it has certain exceptions uh, where a custodian may deny access to records uh, if it's contrary to the public interest. And one of the examples they give is that if the record is disclosed and it quote, might endanger the life or <clears throat> physical safety of an individual. So endangering the life or physical safety of an individual is the operative language that we were asked to evaluate. Uh, again, they weren't our employees, so we went out to the districts and said, is there anyone in your district whose life or physical safety would be endangered by the disclosure of their name? And we received about 43 um, from around the state that said, yes, if, if this staff member's name is released, it will threaten his or her uh, physical safety. And uh, the, the common explanation was the domestic violence situation. So um, that is how we interpreted our responsibility under the public records law. Uh, and we, we believe there were reasonable um, explanations from the school districts as to why those names should be withheld under that. Madam Co-Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman. You know, I think it's dangerous to go down the road, um, Representative Stiff is um, walking us down, that somehow by um, not producing that record that that equates with for a, law, a statutorily lawful reason that the legislature has indicated is a proper basis for denial equates with secret and, and that is a fallacy that one does not equate with the other I mean, so the department of education through its due diligence and careful review you know determined that it was lawful for them to withhold that particular record not in an issue of avoiding transparency or to create, quote, secrecy, but rather to be compliant with the law, recognizing that uh, the analysis doesn't stop there um, for the public interest and public transparency uh, when it comes to making some of these determinations. So if the legislature doesn't want there to be exceptions, then we need to remove all those exceptions, which of course would be bad business, but we have provided exceptions to disclosure 
and that does not necessarily equate with secrets or lack of transparency or attempting to hide information, um, particularly when potentially that same information can be revealed in other ways, assuming that the public records request actually doesn't want to know that, you know, Mrs. Smith, who teaches the third grade, who had an ex-abusive husband, um, is working at this local school district, but rather they just want to know how proceeds are being spent, how many teachers they have, and what's their salaries, you know, why it's, it's fundamentally critical to know that she works at that school district or what her home address is, I'm not sure, balances the needs for government transparency and fiscal responsibilities that can't be met in that particular circumstance with that particular statutory exception. Senator Anselmi Dalton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Shainer. I, obviously, you know, I'm all for us being as transparent as possible, you know, without having too much clutter. I'm just concerned about this sort of layered game that's coming into this bill. It sounds like then you hand it off down and then this person has to go running around to 45 people when maybe you have that information. I mean, this is a real onus on you just to say that people under you get this information to me and have a one sole spot, you know, for this person. I don't want to have people have to go through shell games to get information. And I just wonder how big of an onus was it to say, well, you guys are kind of in charge of, you know, you're the Department of Education. You can say, hey, people under us, give us this information. Let's get it out to the person. So how hard was this to do? Mr. Shaner. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you, Senator, it, um, I, I don't know if I would say it was more, more or less difficult than any other challenge we face. Uh, what, what I think where it's problematic is that um, it is not, um, is not the fidelity of a survey out to districts asking for this type of information um, isn't, I'm not great, I'm not very comfortable with, with that process in terms of making sure that everybody that uh, was potentially endangered uh, had the opportunity to share that with their administration and the administration share it with us. It just, it was not, um, I mean, it was a new process that we tried to implement under a tight timeline. Uh, and so I think that going forward, it would benefit everyone if there was a way to uh, legislatively delineate what that process should be going forward so that we, we don't end up in, a, in another tight jam trying to um, do our due diligence in protecting those individuals in a short time frame. So, I mean, yes, we were able to, I think, do, do the best we could under the circumstances, uh, but I think we should try to be proactive in dealing with that issue going forward. Uh, and really, the most, uh, the way to do it with the with the most fidelity, the most accuracy, um, protecting those individuals is to have the employer responsible for those employees be the ones that are asked to um, weigh the circumstances with those individuals and determine whether or not the exception applies. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to testify on this topic? I have a list of people that want to testify on public records, but they may be for the next bill. So is there anyone else uh, on the virtual audience who would like to address this? Mr. Farmer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brian Farmer, Wyoming School Boards Association. Um, I will try to be brief. Um, the other side, being on the other side, uh, working with Mr. Shaner on this specific example, um, certainly led our districts to believe that requests should be made um, from the entity um, closest to the record. Um, I, I, I want to tell you briefly a little bit about my own background so I can uh, give light to where this happens elsewhere. Um, prior to working for Wyoming School Boards Association, I worked for the state of Wyoming for about 20 years. Those 20 years were split between the Department of Corrections, the Legislative Service Office, and the University of Wyoming. During that time, certainly we saw other cases where um, records were not just held by one entity. A common example of this uh, is state archives or the state library um, have held records that really are not their records, 
uh, but they hold on to them for other state agencies. Uh, and so uh, the, the discussions in, in, in my previous uh, employment, my previous time was largely about uh, custodian and who was the custodian uh, of the records. The situation with uh, the Department of Education and school districts is different because there is a statute that requires that certain information be collected by the Department of Education uh, that is held by school districts. And so they have this statutory obligation to collect information uh, from the school district that they are not the originator of, that they do not uh, create. Uh, and therefore they may not have uh, all of the information about the, the appropriate management of that record. Um, there was a question um, about uh, uh, folks that are under uh, them. Well, certainly school districts are not under the Department of Education. Um, they are their own separate political entities with their own corporate authority. Um, and they have uh, an ability to sue, be sued, uh, to make decisions, to contract, uh, to do all of these things separate from the Department of the Ed Education. So they may have an interest that is separate from the department. And so if they hold the record and want to go in one direction, and the department holds the record and wants to go in a different direction, uh, then that creates a problem as to what is the proper management of the record. Um, another uh, instance may be that um, uh, one entity may choose to deny the record uh, where another may, may not have made that decision because of differences in uh, information related to the records, but it's always the person that denies uh, that's going to have to defend that. Uh, they're going to have to defend that before uh, the person who's unhappy that their record request was denied. They may have to defend that before the court. And so now in, in the situation Mr. Shaner described, um, it is entirely possible that somebody could go to the court and say, well, tell us more about why you denied 43 cases, 43 records. And they have some information about the denials, they, they, they may not have complete information in order to uh, defend that uh, before uh, the court um, and would again have to go back to the school district and get that from the school district. So it just makes sense to ask the people that have uh, the records that generate that, uh, that are the best uh, suited uh, to, to answer those questions. Um, and again, this is a, a bit unique because of the statutory authority um, of the Department of Education to hold those records. Um, again, being different from others who may have records that were created by another uh, agency or political subdivision um, that uh, they are not considered a custodian of. Uh, and that can get really messy, um, getting into some of the history of, of custodians versus uh, copies of records, original records, and. Uh, and things that uh, state agencies have used in the past to distinguish, is this our record um, just because we have the piece of paper versus is this our record because we created it, hold it, manage it, uh, and the things uh, that the law requires of a custodian. Mr. Chairman, I think with that, um, I will be happy to respond to questions, but would just lend support uh, that it makes sense uh, to ask the originators of records to be the ones to defend uh, and make decisions about the, those records. Thank you. Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Farmer, tell me about the state archives. If we adopt the 21 LSO 162 and it becomes law, and I put in a request to the state archives for any document, can the state archives just say, sorry, we're not the originator? Mr. Farmer. Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, Representative Stith, um, that was former life. I'm not uh, up to uh, what the state does these days with regard to uh, the management of its records, um, whether they make distinctions about uh, whether the state archives are uh, custodians. Um, the person who is in actual custody and control uh, is, has been important historically uh, as to the definition of custodian. Um, so I think it would depend on whether or not uh, the archives is the custodian um, or they would 
point you to the proper custodian um, of, of those records. Representative Stith, follow up. Yes, Mr. Farmer, but doesn't this law, this bill, if adopted, it doesn't matter who the custodian is anymore. It matters who the originator is. If I'm not the originator of the document, I can just say, no, thank you. I don't feel like giving it to you. And wouldn't that apply to virtually every document the state archives keeps? I mean, would the state archives essentially be sealed off from public access? Mr. Farmer. Mr. Chairman, I would hate to speak for a state agency and their interpretation of a statute. I do think that that is in part why Mr. Shaner said that the word originator is pot potentially problematic. Co-Chairman Nethercott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Farmer, if my recollection is correct, it was some of the testimony we heard from, from you and others that requested kind of a bill draft similar to this. If you don't like the word originates, what word should be used? And what do you think is the difference between a custodian of a record versus an agency that has a record by default? Because I know I have a lot of state records, right? I mean, I've got a lot of documents. Um, does that mean by default I'm a custodian of a record? And I know I'm not subject to the Public Records Act as part of my legislative work, but just for purposes to understand how those records can get anywhere, then can anyone be a custodian by deep, by just by having the record in their possession? Or is there some special designation therefore making this bill moot? Mr. Farmer. Mr. Chairman, um, I don't know if I have a um, better uh, definition um, or, or term than originator. I will say that the statute defines a custodian um, as uh, the official custodian, uh, and the official custodian is the person that is responsible for the maintenance, the care, uh, and keeping of the record. Um, and uh, that has oftentimes been uh, the uh, distinguishing characteristic that the custodian is the person who controls um, what happens with that record. Uh, and so um, I, I think um, by mere default of having a copy of a record does not make one a custodian because you don't have that decision-making authority uh, as to what is done with the record. Um, and so uh, it would be my uh, impression that uh, you would have to be responsible for the maintenance, the care, and the keeping of the record, uh, thus the decisions that are made with regard to the use of the record. Um, so in most instances, that would uh, impact under present law uh, the nature of, uh, say, the state archives or the state library uh, entities who may have copies of records, um, but may not be the ones that make those decisions about the maintenance uh, uh, and, and control of the record. Um, I, again, an area that I'm not uh, presently familiar with uh, enough to have a deep conversation, but with regards to school districts, School districts certainly are the ones that create and generate records and control records with regard to personnel. And it uh, just so happens because of a statutory requirement that the Department of Education collect the same information, they would also meet the definition of official custodian. Uh, and so I believe that for the most part, we've had discussions over the history of the Wyoming Public Records Act as to the authority of the custodian uh, and what exactly a custodian is uh, versus uh, somebody else who may um, have a copy of uh, a record. Uh, so just a brief example of that, um, if I worked for the Department of Corrections and I had a copy of a birth certificate of an inmate, um, I don't have the authority uh, to decide whether or not to release the inmate's birth certificate because I would not be the custodian of that record. I would have a copy of that record, but the custodian of that record 
would be the Department of Health, and they would be the appropriate one uh, to make decisions about the appropriate release of that record. That, that's at least been the history. That was my experience for the time that I worked for the state. Uh, and that would be my impression of what would be correct and appropriate today. But I would need to uh, give uh, a, a deeper look to answer uh, more broadly than what I have. Any other questions? Mr. Farmer. I see no other questions. Mr. Farmer, is there anyone else out in the public who'd like to speak to this topic. Mr. Chairman, hi, this is Shannon Anderson with Powder River Basin Resource Council. Good morning. Welcome, Shannon. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of our members of the, in the state of Wyoming, we oppose this bill. And specifically for the reasons that Representative Stiff laid out to you earlier today, um, Almost all of our records request request correspondence. And that correspondence is often between two governmental entities. Um, there's a two line in that correspondence. There's a from line in that correspondence. Both the receiver and the recipient are custodians of that electronic correspondence. Um, sometimes there's even um, an attachment to that correspondence that perhaps originated from a third governmental entity. Um, so what this bill would do, unfortunately, is force the requester of these records to go to at least two, if not more, separate um, agencies and request the same record um, because you have to go to the originator of that record. So the, the two line, um, you can't go to the from line. Um, and that really is a problem for requesting correspondence under, under the Records Act. Um, as the, the staff comment notes in the draft bill, um, there already is an exception if the record isn't under the custody and control of the agency that you requested the records from. Um, but that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with records that actually are under the custody and control of the agency they are going to and requesting that record from. Um, so it is their obligation, regardless of whether the record originated with them, to provide that record to the requester. Um, that's the whole point of the custody and control language in the Public Records Act. Um, origination would take this to a whole new level um, that is just not contemplated currently within the, the balance of the Records Act. Um, from testimony earlier today, it seems that the bill was drafted really for a single request um, and that situation um, based on the Department of Education. Um, I can't speak to that particular request, um, but I can speak to a similar situation that we often deal with, um, and that's confidential commercial information. Um, so when we request information from a governmental entity um, that may include confidential commercial information from a private party, for instance, um, the governmental entity then consults with the originator of that record. Um, in that case, it would be a private party, but um, someone who could claim a confidential commercial information exemption to the Records Act. Um, and then the governmental entity through that consultation then determines whether or not to withhold that record. Um, so it, it seems like that's exactly what happened here with the Department of Education. Um, they were asked to produce records. Um, they didn't feel comfortable making the ultimate determination of whether the records should be withheld. Um, they consulted with the parties that, that should make that determination and the records request was resolved. Um, so it, it seems like it actually worked um, the way the law intends, um, really for any of the exemptions under the Records Act, not just the one cited by the Department of Education. Um, there's, there's frequently um, exemptions where the, the agency that you've requested the information from needs to go to consult with somebody um, to determine whether the records should be withheld. Um, and that process works every day um, in response to Records Act right now already. Um, so with that, I would just um, urge you to vote against the bill. I think it creates way more problems than it solves and um, encourage you again to be champions of transparency, um, to reduce barriers to public access um, and to allow the requesters of information to have the simplest proce process possible for them um, to get the records that um, they deserve from governmental entities. Um, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Any questions? Any questions for Ms. Anderson? 
Okay, thank you for your input. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the public that would like to speak to this matter? Any more blue hands or? Okay, I don't see any more public comment. So I'll close public comment and bring it before a committee. Committee, what is your pleasure? Move the bill. Second. Moved by, moved by Von Flatern. Is there a second? Second. Second by Pinnell. Are there any suggestions for amendments to the bill? Representative Pinnell? No, okay. Uh, Senator Von Flatern. My amendment, Mr. Chairman, would be on line nine of the second uh, page two and shall forward to the request within five business days after, and then at the end uh, on line 10, holding the original sought for inspection after five business days, the clerk will start, I don't know how to say this, but start the, the other agency or agency or start the clock or something of that nature needs to be put at the end of line 10 on inspections. So it would read uh, and shall forward the request, page line nine, and shall forward the request within five business days to the governmental entity holding the original record sought for inspection. After five days, the clerk will start or something on, on the other agency. Mr. Chair, I'll second for the purpose of discussion, although I, I'm really not liking the whole originator concept. Okay, the amendment has been seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? And did anyone need clarity or about uh, the part on line 10? Mr. Chairman Montflater, yes. I would ask that LSO shape that language to fit the uh, need. But my thought is that after five days, the clock, the clock will start. Mr. Fuller, right off hand, do you have language for that spot? Mr. Chairman, I have some language. Um, so first, just to walk through the amendment on page nine or page two, line nine, after request, <laughs> insert within five business days. And then on line 11, a new sentence after known, which would read, the time limit in paragraph C3 of the section shall begin upon forwarding the request as required. Um, that time, that, that reference is to the 30 day limit for producing the records. Mr. Chairman, that's perfect. That's acceptable. acceptable. Acceptable to the second. Right, any further discussion on the amendment? All right, let's vote on the amendment. All in favor of Senator Von Flader's proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Six, seven, I see, I believe nine. Would all opposed please raise their hand? Okay, I see two opposed, so that amendment passes. Are there any further suggestions for amendments to the bill? Are there, is there any discussion of the bill? Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, just briefly, as I indicated by my prior questions, I oppose the bill for two reasons. One is it seems to put a, an undue burden on the requestors, uh, especially in the case of correspondence going back and forth, that the bill seems overly broad. But the bigger objection from my point of view is that by creating a sole source of information, uh, a state agency uh, doesn't have the same incentive to ensure the integrity of the response. And so if a state agency doesn't produce a document, uh, the requester may not be able to challenge that lack of production because the requester may not have any reason to know that the document even exists. So I think our current system that has a kind of checks and balances that's convenient for the requestors and uh, gives each agency an incentive to produce and make a complete response uh, uh, 
uh, is, is a good system. I don't think the one example cited by the Department of Education created enough problems that we should uh, overhaul the uh, statutory scheme. So for that reason, I'm against. Any further discussion on the bill? Anyone else? Question. Are ready? Call for the question. Question has been called for. Secretary will call the roll and this will be a, a, a one where it has to pass each body. Mr. Chairman, this is a roll call vote on 21 LSO 162 as amended. Senator Anselmi Dalton. No. Senator Bonner. No. Senator Cox. No. Senator Von Slater. Aye. Representative Burlingame. Aye. Representative Gray. No. Representative Jennings. No. Representative Felton. No. Representative Ponell. Aye. Representative Salazar. No. Representative Stitt. No. Representative Washington. No. Co-Chairman Medicott. She appears to be out of the room right now, Mary Beth. No. Mr. Chairman, that failed. Okay. Thank you, committee. Thanks, uh, witnesses, for your help with this matter. That bill fails, and we'll move on to the third bill of the morning. And Mr. Fuller will introduce that to us. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, before I dive into the bill, I just wanted to highlight um, a handout that's included in the meeting materials. At the last meeting, there was um, some discussion and question about what exactly constitutes or, or what information is placed in a, a personnel file. That's 3-01 in the meeting materials for Ms. Creech, um, and it outlines the uh, Wyoming Department of Administration Information's policy on what information is required to be included in a personnel file, as well as the Society for Human Resource Management's recommendations for what documents should be included in a personnel file. Um, so those are all outlined um, in, that, in that fact sheet, and she's available to answer any questions if the committee has any um, on, that, on that fact sheet. Very good. Thank you. Then, Mr. Chairman, um, moving on then, um, 3-04 in the meeting materials, this is 21 LSO 163, uh, working draft point six. And in discussing the exemptions to the Public Records Act at the last meeting, um, the committee moved for a bill draft um, to amend the personnel file exemption, a mandatory exemption under the act um, to create different classes of employees and, and specify what information from the personnel file for this um, class of employees may be um, available for public inspection. The committee appointed a working group of representatives Gray, Pelkey, and Washett to work on this bill draft in between the two meetings. And this bill draft reflects, um, reflects their work and discussions um, as it was being prepared. This bill draft in summary amends the personnel file exemption um, to authorize the inspection of performance data and, and evaluations for specified public employees. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute in the, uh, in the draft. Starting on page two, line four, um, this amends the definitions that are applicable to the entire Public Records Act. And first is a new definition for institution of higher education, um, which is actually defined elsewhere in the act, but it's, it's being moved here um, just to mean the University of Wyoming and any community college in the state. On page two, line eight, this is the definition of specified public employee. So this would be the group of employees who would um, see expanded information from their personnel file be available for public inspection. Um, before that, I, I, before diving into that, I'll note the staff comment on page two. 
Um, the, the working group highlighted the question of whether the language in that introductory language on lines eight and nine um, should be clarified to specify whether it applies to former employees as well as current employees. Um, and, and if the committee decides that it should apply to former employees, whether some sort of temporal limit um, should, be, should be included um, in, that, in that language that specifies the, the public, uh, the former employees. So then moving on to line 25, these are the employees who are considered specified public employees. So it'd be the attorney general, department directors, and the director of any legislative agency. Moving on to page three, line one, uh, the president of any institution of higher education, which would include UW and the community colleges. Line four would be the uh, chief executive officer or director of any separate operating agency, and those are listed in the staff comment. Um, that statutory reference to 92-1704-D um, is listed in the staff comment um, beginning in the second half of page three. Then on line seven, the, the commissioners of the Public Service Commission and the members of the State Board of Equalization. And then line 10, managers and assistant managers of any county or municipality in Wyoming. And these um, entries were, were taken from the list of, from the definition of public employee in part, that's in the Ethics and Disclosure Act. That was kind of the starting point for, for what employees would be covered under this expanded access. Um, on page four, the, the staff comment continues, and I would just highlight the two paragraphs at the bottom. Um, first, um, a, a question that came up during, during review, whether um, other public officials of municipal government, um, for example, mayors, should be included in the subparagraph regarding um, city managers and assistant managers, and whether county should be referenced in that language. Um, I, I personally am unaware if any counties have managers. Um, that would be ultimately a decision for the committee to decide whether to include that language. Um, and then that, that second paragraph, as I mentioned, um, the employees that are listed, it's based on the Ethics and Disclosure Act, and it's um, a point of discussion for the committee whether those employees or other employees should be included in that list that's on pages two and three. Mr. Chairman, then moving on to page five, line 19. Um, this is an amendment to the uh, discretionary exception for, um, for, for applications for the position of president for an institution of higher education. It just includes a sentence that uh, it conforms to the changes elsewhere in the draft to state that the paragraph doesn't apply to current presidents of institutions of higher education. And then on line 21, it strikes the, the definition, um, which is moved to the, um, the definition section. Moving on to page six, line four. This, these are the amendments to the personal file exemption itself. And first on line four is clarifying language to state that for all employees of governmental entities, personnel files are available to the duly elected or appointed officials who supervises the work of the person in interest. Um, so there's no change in the substance there. On lines nine and 10, um, this provides that applications, performance ratings, and scholastic achievement data for all employees of a governmental entity, that's the inserted language, um, shall be available to the person in interest and to the duly elected and appointed officials who supervise his work. Uh, once again, no change in the substance of, of that part. Line 15 just inserts of a governmental entity um, as clarifying language. And then the new language, Mr. Chairman and committee members begins on line 17. And this first sentence states that personal information that would constitute an unwarranted invasion of privacy shall not be available for inspection. The next sentence on line 20 states that applications performance ratings, and elements of performance for specified public employees, so those are the employees defined earlier in the bill draft, shall be available for public inspection. Then the next sentence that begins on line 22 states that subject to any of the provisions of this act, documents that are placed within a personnel file are not automatically exempt from inspection um, under, this, under this paragraph. Mr. Chairman, finally, the staff comment on page seven um, just highlights considerations for the committee. Um, first, there is no definition um, for what is meant by elements of performance. 
um, that would become available for the for inspection for those specified employees. Uh, there are possible definitions for the committee to consider, but uh, by no means is that an exhaustive list or or any sort of um, you know yay or nay regarding regarding that language. Those are just examples for the committee to, to consider. To the next bullet point at the bottom of page seven and going on to page eight, um, just highlights that there's no definition in the bill draft for what is an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Uh, the Wyoming Supreme Court has noted um, in a case concerning an exemption for, um, for hospital records relating to medical administration that um, they adopted, they, they highlighted language that they would deem constitutes an unwarranted invasion of privacy. And that would be unwarranted publicity, unwarranted appropriation or exploitation of one's personality or the publicizing of one's personal affairs or private affairs with which the public had no legitimate concern. Um, and then below that are, are two um, definitions of unwarranted invasion of personal privacy that other states have um, in their Public Records Act. And then finally, this would be effective July 1st of 2021. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer questions about the bill draft. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Any questions for Brian about the personal personnel files bill? Any questions before we launch into our discussion? Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Fuller. I uh, appreciate your work on this bill. And, and just to frame a little bit the discussion for the committee, I mean, what is your opinion on um, the definition of employee? I mean, I, I, my opinion is that it applies if it's a past employee, if it's a current. Um, there was discussion on that in the working group. Ultimately, one of the reasons why we didn't specify is because there was some disagreement about what subst substantively uh, we should do. And, but I think once the committee comes up with uh, a decision on whether it should apply former, current, uh, et cetera, that we should probably clarify if it is in fact unclear. And so my question is, do you think it, it applies uh, to, to past employees as well? My opinion is it probably does, but what, what's yours? Mr. Fuller. Mr. Chairman, you know, I, I hesitate to offer, you know, specific opinions. That said, you know, the one thing I would note is that means any of the following employees, and, and the question I think then really becomes, um, who is an employee? You know, if, if a person is no longer the president of a, you know, community college, for example, are they, are they then an employee? Um, I think that would be the question that would come up if, you know, if, if, you know, there was a question about whether this applied to former employees or not. Right. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Could I have a follow up? Yes, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Fuller, did you see any uh, precedent on this? Because, I mean, I think about an employee that might move to another agency or an employee that might move to another state. And I, I definitely think that it is um, relevant. Um, so did you see any precedent on that? I, I would be surprised if there hadn't been one. Mr. Fuller. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, um, having only looked at, you, you know, what we have, I didn't see anything that, that delineated between this. Any other questions for Mr. Fuller? Senator Von Flater. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Would this mean that if somebody was doing a search or had an employee come to them or a person that came to them and said, I want a job and we're taking applications. Could they then, if you included former employees, could they then call a state and ask for their records? Mr. Fuller? Mr. Chairman, Senator Von Flater, um, for the employees who are, you know, I, I think first off that, that gets to the question of, you know, I think the distinction if it's, you know, whether it's a current or former employee, but, you know, generally speaking, if the person's an employee and say applying to another job um, and they're, they're, they, they are currently working for an agency specified here, then, um, you know, though, you know, the applications and elements of performance would be available for public inspection. Senator Von Flader. 
So, Mr. Fuller, if I was to um, interview this person as a private entity, uh, could I then reach into the state and grab all their uh, former employee files? Fuller? Mr. Chairman, Senator Von Flater, um, what would, for those specified public employees, what would be available would be applications, performance ratings, and elements of performance. So, so those parts of the personnel file for the specified public employees would be available for public inspection. Representative Stiff. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fuller, I have a question about the scope of managers and assistant managers of any county or municipality in Wyoming. Uh, it's on page three, line 10. And just so I'm clear, who would count as a manager or assistant manager of a county, if you know? Mr. Fuller. Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith, and, and that was the, the point um, highlighted in the staff comment on, on page four um, in terms of whether county should be included. Um, I, I personally am unaware of a county manager, but um, that, that was more of kind of just to, to cover the bases. Um, and, and ultimately, it's for the committee to decide whether that language um, for county should or should not be included. Anything else, committee? Any questions for Mr. Fuller? Before we move to public comment? All right, let's move to public comment. And I have a list of five individuals uh, that's been given to me by Ms. Oates Falls. So I have uh, Shannon Anderson, uh, then the Wyoming Press Association, Mr. Downing, Mr. Farmer, Ms. Craven and Mr. Odekoven. So we'll go in that order if you're all in the room and call on Ms. Anderson first. If, if she's here, maybe she's already moved out. Maybe she was just here for the last bill. Okay, let's go to uh, Press Association folks, Mr. Downing. He was here, Ms. Hoffman. All right, Mr. Farmer, do you have anything on this topic? Mr. Chairman, no, I don't. Uh, thank you, though. Okay. And uh, Ms. Craven's name is, is here, but I don't see her. Ms. Craven. Mr. Odekova. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Byron Odekoven on behalf of the Wyoming Association of Sheriffs and Chiefs. Uh, thank you to the working group and Representative Gray, who sent out the draft, if you will, for us to have a little look at it prior to today's discussion. So thank you, uh, Representative Gray, for that. Uh, um, the bill is, is concerning, and I'm not real sure how to, to clarify that without bringing in a host of other personnel law as well, um, and, and not sure quite how to uh, clarify the discussion because the bill makes some very broad application to an entire personnel file, but then appears to limit it to specific people, but then in the staff comments as well, doesn't, um, rein in, if you will, the privacy concerns of those people who are traditionally mentioned and their information is well contained within a personnel file. Um, so I think there still needs to be additional work in that regard uh, so that those folks are protected um, in your interest to review uh, the personnel actions as it relates to some of the, the uh, department heads which some of them are, are somewhat under your control, kind of. Um, I, I was forewarned, if you will, that there will be a move to add amendments to the bill to broaden this out um, and may even want to encompass uh, law enforcement personnel um, in somewhat of an attempt to make it easier to deal with court proceedings and backgrounds of officers uh, for the purposes of impeaching the witness 
uh, during a trial. And I would remind the committee before we start that discussion that the law enforcement records are subject to public review by the judge uh, based upon the motion of the attorneys. And if the judge deems those motions to be appropriate, the personnel records are released. So uh, there is a mechanism to deal with officer records within the court setting uh, for trial purposes. This is for uh, the release of these records are outside of that venue and provide more of a blanket release of personnel records. And as I say, may need to have some additional clarification to provide for that level of specificity that you would like to have without jeopardizing other folks' security within those records. And Mr. Chairman, I think I'll, with, I'll, I'll wait for your conclusion to the work uh, and react specifically to the, to the specifics of those amendments and discussions at a future date. Thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Any feedback from Mr. Odekoven? Any questions for him about his testimony? Anything from Mr. Odekoven? Okay, I am not hearing any uh, questions for you, so thank you. Are there any other witnesses in the, uh, either in the Capitol or out there in Zoom land who'd like to speak to this bill? Mr. Chairman, I don't see anyone. Okay, thank you, Mary Beth. All right, uh, we'll close public comment on then and bring it before the committee. Committee, what is your pleasure? Bill. Moved by Representative Gray, seconded by Senator Von Flatern. Are there any suggestions for amendments to the bill? Representative Gray? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, I guess I would ask Mr. Fuller, I would like to make it clear that uh, for the, the, uh, the purpose of performance ratings, applications, everything in this bill that it applies to current or former employees, where, where do you suggest doing that? Mr. Yeah. Fuller. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, I think the, the simplest and most direct way to do that would be page two, line nine, after following, insert current and former um, employees. Mr. Chairman, could I ask Mr. Fuller a question? Yes, Representative Gray. Does that have any other implications in other, any other places in the act? If you're specifying it there, would it? and think great problems in other places. Mr. Fuller? Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, um, since specified public employee is used only in that personnel file exemption, um, it would only, that's the only place that former employees would, that reference would come into play. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I would move to do that, add, add current and former to page two, line nine, right? Before employees. Okay. That's what you said, right? Yeah, I think that's what you said. Seconded by Jennings. Any discussion on the amendment? You're all, Representative Washett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is one where I have a bit of a heartache with this in that what we're doing is we're changing the rules after things have been in their personnel files historically. Um, things could have been put in personnel files 10 years ago and uh, put there for a reason, and you know, understanding what the law was then with regards to what was private and what was not. So I have a little bit of a heartburn here that we're going to now make a, a former employee's personnel file uh, subject to access when the 
people who were in charge of that file and the information in that file years ago um, were operating under a different set of rules. So, you know, if we want to make it current and former employees as of, you know, some date certain, but I just have a problem with the retroactivity aspect of, of this provision. Any other comments on the proposed amendment? <laughs> Representative Gray? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, it's a policy choice. And I, I think uh, we're gonna have a vote in a minute. I would just say, I think in terms of transparency, I think these I think these records are, are relevant in these in these positions. And so um, I'm gonna be voting aye. But I do understand the, the point Mr. Washington is making. Thank you. Any other discussion on the amendment? We ready to vote? All those in favor of the uh, proposed language on page two, line nine, please raise your hand. Keep it raised. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I believe. All those opposed, please raise your hands. I have one, two, three, Four. At any rate, the amendment passes. Are there any further suggestions for amendment? Any further suggestions for amendments to the bill? Any discussion in general on the bill? Any discussion? Senator Von Flader? Thank you. I think the um staff had asked us about the elements of performance and that definition to be put in there and elements of performance i would amend to say elements of performance means any information that bears on the public duties of a specified public employee that is my amendment and senator von flater and where in the bill is that can you uh, that would probably that would be on page seven and it probably go into definitions on page two probably right was there a second for senator von flader and senator anselmi dalton with the second any discussion on that proposed amendment any representative gray thanks mr chairman i guess i just ask a question um some people that have been interacted with the statute, I guess, Representative Pelkey, maybe, Ed. what do you think are the implications of that? Representative Pelkey, are you going to take the bait? Yes, you are. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take the bait and, uh, and demure. I really haven't thought through what those ramifications might be. So, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm, uh, I think I'll, I'll vote in support of the amendment. Representative Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My first blush thought on this is, is that that's probably the most uh, wide open and, and broad language we could choose. So if the desire of the committee is, is to make this as broad as possible, I think the amendment does that. Um, that makes me a little nervous when I think about anything that might bear upon uh, your performance. Uh, to me, that seems awfully broad, and I'd probably be a no vote. Senator Von Flader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, elements of performance, I'm trying to fill in a hole here, and you certainly can change it in um, when it comes in front of your committee in the future. Further discussion on the amendment? Is everyone clear? It would, Mr. Fuller, would you give us feedback on what you've heard us say in terms of the language here on the amendment? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. So it would be page seven, lines 18, 19, and 20. That language would be inserted on page two after line two, and then renumber as necessary. Okay, thank you. Co-Chairman Nethercott. 
Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman. Uh, committee members, I was at the Capitol this morning and have returned home because I have better net, better internet connection and I can engage with you more readily, just so you know. Um, that's where I was. I, I could barely hear you um, before at the Capitol. So hopefully my participation here will be more effective. Responding to um, Representative Gray, I know he, he asked Representative Pelkey, but I do work in this statute almost daily. You know, I applaud the efforts, but what I think one of the unintended consequences will be in a policy decision for the committee as well is increased and significant litigation against our government entities by employees who are dissatisfied with what goes into their personnel record. And, and that's appropriate, um, arguably, uh, because when, an, when a supervisor can put something in your personnel file that is for the public's consumption, um, you know, what rights does that employee have concerning what goes into their personnel file? And so what happens is, um, you know, it becomes a, a rigorous battle uh, within the government entity itself over that personnel file about what should be in it and what shouldn't be in it. And you can understand both sides. I think the result ultimately is that government becomes less effective at supervising its employees and employees become more fearful um, of those government entities for which they work for and perhaps creating an environment where they don't want to be um, as a result of some of these pieces. So just kind of big picture thoughts that I have grave concern over, which is how this really looks for the people living under these conditions, as opposed to we the public want to know how, you know, Mr. Smith is performing in his job and because we don't like the way he treated us um, at our last public exchange with him. And so we're going to go get his personnel file. So those are things to, I think, think about. Um, and again, concerns that I have. So Madam Co-Chairman, and we can hear you better. So that was a good move. Specific to the amendment to Senator Von Flanders amendment, what you just said, uh, bear on that. Mr. Co-Chairman, yes. I. I think that the definitions itself are all very poor and ambiguous. And so um, I, the staff comment, I think helps to narrow that down, but I think it's still wholly ineffective. So I'm a no vote. Okay. Any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Gray. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I, I, my question was, and we can get into that debate in a moment, but I mean, I, my question was about that definition of public performance. I just want to be clear on that. I mean, I, I think uh, I think we probably do need a definition, and um, I think this one is is a good good start. So I'm gonna be voting aye on this, and then and then we can get into the discussion on the bill um, in a moment. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion on the proposed amendment? Call for the question. Let's call for the question. Uh, all those in favor, please raise their hand and leave them raised. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I believe I'm counting eleven fours. All those opposed the amendment, please raise their hand. I see three against. So that amendment passes. Are there any further suggestions for amendment? Representative Representative Stiff. Mr. Chairman, I don't have a specific proposed amendment, but I did want to ask the other members of the committee their opinions about what is and what is not a personnel file. I thought the memo staff prepared was really uh, insightful or helpful in seeing how personnel files can be defined very, very different ways. We have on page uh, six and page seven, so starting with line 22 on page six, it says, subject to the provisions of this act, documents placed within a personnel file are not automatically exempt from inspection under this paragraph. And I, so my question is, is just if a judge is looking at this, the judge is gonna try to figure out what is and what is not a personnel file and what pieces of paper inside a personnel file count as part of the personnel file. So, but I, I'm not aware of a definition of personnel file in the statute generally, so, I don't have a particular suggestion. I'm just throwing that out as a potential area of vagueness that could cause us problems. So. Representative Gray. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just want to get a little bit into the statutory, you know, the intention there and in this and the history, the legislative history on the subcommittee. I mean, we talked quite a bit about that last sentence and um, the intent of that last sentence has been always to address uh, the, the concern that we heard in our last meeting that things are being inserted into the personnel file that are not personnel file issues to trigger the automatic exemption. And so in this bill, it's kind of a bifurcated, uh, there's really two, you look from 30,000 feet up, maybe we should have talked a little more about this at the start. There's really two things we're trying to do with this bill. One, we're, we're creating a certain class where performance issues within the personnel file are not exempt. And there's four classifications there. And then the second issue, which is really only dealt with in that one sentence was to deal with this uh, concern in the last meeting that things are just being inserted into there just to trigger the automatic exemption, even outside of those four classes that that um, at any time, and that that would not be appropriate. And so that sentence deals with that issue. And so really, there's two kind of things that this bill is trying to do. And that that sentence is the second thing and, and the concern. Now, we can get into whether that sentence actually does that or not. Um, we went through a couple iterations in the language there. I think we're pretty close with the way that reads, but um, yeah, that, that, I just want to make sure we're clear first, oftentimes good to know the intention first, you know, in terms of the legal, when you get into the legal language and that's the intention of that sentence. And it's a little bit different from the rest of the bill. Representative Stitt. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Representative Gray, thank you. I, I appreciate the intention there. So help me out with the definition. Well, if you're the judge and you're trying to decide what is and what's not part of a personnel file, wouldn't it be nice if you had a definition of what a personnel file is? And do, I mean, do we need that? Mr. Chairman, can I go ahead? Yes, Representative Gray. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Representative Stith, I, I think that might be an, a, an, an improvement. Um, you know, it's something maybe we could we could do now at the, the next time the committee hears the bill. Um, obviously there, the getting that definition right, I think is important. Um, but I don't think even if we, even if we decide at this time not to define, although I think that is a good purpose, I don't think that makes the sentence. Um, the sentence is, is part of, I think, why you need a definition and would work well with the definition because the sentence is trying to say, you can't just insert something into the personnel file to trigger, trigger the exemption. But I think you're right that that might, that makes sense to do. Although defining things can, yeah, but I, I you gotta do it correctly. Okay. Other thoughts on the bill? We could still entertain an amendment if anyone has one. Any discussion in general on the bill? Representative Mr. Pinal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, just uh, from listening to the, uh, the different concerns in this bill, I don't believe the bill is ready for prime time yet. I, 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 I would urge a no vote on this uh, bill at this time. I, I do believe it needs more work because, um, you know, we're talking about adding a few different things to it. Uh, and I know we've done these things in the past where we present a bill in committee to present to the floor and it's not ready. And of course it uh, goes down in, in, in large flames, but I just don't believe this bill is ready and I would urge a no vote on this uh, particular bill. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion on the bill? Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, a couple things I want to say. First, on the the comments from uh, the co-chairman during the amendment, um, I, I think we need to be clear, and I try to do this in talking with Representative Stith about what this bill does. And so, it creates four classifications where performance ratings are exempt from uh, the exemption from the Public Records Act. If that makes sense. So, right now, uh, the personnel files are totally exempt. Um, from the Public Records Act. And this creates four carve outs in matters of, of what I would say are high public importance. So presidents of uh, the university and community colleges, uh, agency heads, um, uh, city managers, and uh, the fourth one is escaping me at the moment. I'll, 
Uh, but anyway, there, there's four, four classifications. And so it's not for uh, any employee. It's for uh, employees that, that have uh, heavy public roles. And um, I, I think that's, uh, that's appropriate. Um, so I just want to be clear that it's not for any employee. It's, it's, it's for classifications in, in areas of um, high public importance and uh, supervisory roles uh, that are very important to the, the public. The decisions that agency heads are, are making or are, are, have huge implications um, for, uh, for the people of Wyoming. And for those to be uh, exempt from being a public record, that performance, I think, um, I, I just, I, I don't agree that they should be exempt. So I, I wanna first, you know, I, I think from those comments, I wanna take a moment here from 30,000 feet up to say what the bill does. You know, on the prime time issue, you know, I'd ask what, what, what makes it not ready for prime time? I'd be honest of the bills we've done in this committee and I've in many instances, uh, been critical of the committee. I think there are bills that have not been ready for prime time. This is one of the ones that I feel a lot more confident about. The subcommittee had two meetings on this. Uh, we, we, we hashed out the language. Um, you know, there are definitions that we could add, but when you add a definition, um, there are legal implications to that definition. So sometimes you let the, the courts hash out some of these things. Personnel files not defined anyway. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there's an argument to define it, but um, there's also an argument not to. So, I mean, if you were to cite issues of it not being ready for prime time, it's that the definition hasn't, maybe certain things haven't been defined that aren't defined anyway. Um, and uh, there are strategic reasons to let that be hashed out by somebody that's looking at the actual issue in front of them. Um, and, and that's, I think, what the legislature's lean towards in the past. I think that's what the subcommittee leaned towards with understanding that the committee would make the ultimate decision and the committee doesn't appear to want to move in that direction to define. But that's the only thing I could think of that, that would be, so I would ask, what, why would it not be ready for prime time? And I think that's kind of, when, when we use that, we need to actually explain why. Um, and I would say of, of the bills in this committee, this is one of the ones I've seen most ready. It's a policy choice and and I certainly um, uh, lean towards it, and I, I, I'm going to be voting aye on this bill. Thank you. Representative Burlingame. Um, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I I lost my thought there. It's back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, folks, for the uh, good debate on this. I, I I've gone back and forth on it, but I I think uh, a really compelling argument to me that we didn't get the bill where we needed to go was Vice Chairman Stith saying, you know, a, a judge is going to need a definition <laughs> to move forward on it. So I think we, the committee did really good work on it, but I agree, I think, with Mr. Pinnell that, like, it's just going to get shellacked on the floor if we bring it forward and it's current. Um, so I think I'm a no on it. Thank you. Okay. Representative Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think we're aware that the bill, if we present it today, will get some additional attention <clears throat> by the committee uh, during this session. And on the House side, especially, this committee is going to see some significant changes in, in makeup. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of discussion again on this bill uh, before it comes to the floor for a formal vote. Uh, many opportunities to tweak it, but I think it's ready to move forward, and I'll be an I vote. Okay, anyone else wish to uh, co-chairman Nithika? I just have some questions on the language, if I can, Mr. Chairman. So on um, page three, line five, and, and maybe it's this, when we reference any separate operating agency, what does that mean? What is that? What is that in relationship to the separate operating agency? Um, and our commissioners of like the PSC and the State Board of Equalization are they employees? 
or are they, uh, you know, appointees? Um, just for kind of understanding those differences. And uh, yeah, and I think that the, the committee discussed already the managers and assistant managers. I mean, I don't know that those are defined, you know, I don't know, you know, like Cheyenne, for example, doesn't have a manager like that. We have a strong mayor who is the chief executive officer, unlike the city of Casper, which I think has a strong city administrator. So, I mean, no effect if it doesn't apply, but um, it just kind of may be confusing and arguments may come out by who is a manager within a city or an assistant manager if they don't necessarily have that technical title. And maybe that's not worth discussing, but just as we have carved out these four exceptions, maybe some further clarification for me on those fronts. Thank you. Any response? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fuller. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Heathercott, I can respond to at least a couple of those questions. First, the, the reference for separate operating agency, that just comes directly from the language of 921704D that spells out those, those agencies. Um, it just says separate operating agency. So that was the genesis of, of that language. Um, in terms of um, the, the question of the, the public service commissioners and, and the members of the board of equalization, um, the only, uh, the, the point is a fair one, whether they are indeed employees, um, given that this came from the Ethics and Disclosure Act as kind of the, the baseline starting point, um, that is how they are currently referred to in that act. Um, they're, def they're defined as public employees. Um, whether, whether that nomenclature is, is truly accurate or not, I, I think that's ultimately a question for the committee to decide as it, as it works the bill. Thank you. Representative Gray. Yeah, Mr. Fuller, um, I got a question for you off of that. I mean, I, I think um, would it on the assistant manager and manager, I mean, why didn't I'm trying to remember in our, our discussions on this, would it help to refer to the statute where those are created in, in the incorporation statutes for municipalities? Mr. Fuller. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, um, I, I'll admit I'm unaware um, of that statute. But but if there is if there is indeed a statute referring to a city manager, um, certain I, it, it could add clarity to in, include that here. Okay, we're in a Senator Von Flater. I do believe that Gillette has a city manager. And so I think we have a city manager in the county may have a somebody that's an administrative, I don't know, I'd ask uh, Representative Ponell on that one exactly, but um, it, are, is there, are they called or labeled a manager? Mr. Fuller? Yeah, Mr. Chairman and Representative Gray, to your question, I took a quick look. There is indeed a statute um, that spells out um, that, you know, for, for, for a municipality that employs this form of government, they shall employ a city manager. Um, so that is, that is indeed specified. Okay. Or, uh, Representative Gray. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fuller, do you think you could craft some language really quick to refer to that statute or maybe we take a, uh, I, I think we could do it now, but I mean, maybe if the chairman think we need a break to give a little time to do that, I think it would be good to refer to the, the, the incorporation statutes for our municipalities. Cause I, I don't think, I, I think it would be good for the clarity. I, I think that was a good point. Ms. Fuller. Mr. Chairman, I, I think it could be as as simple as saying managers of municipalities employed under um, what I mean, statute 154202. Does that work, Representative Gray? Yeah, managers of municipalities <clears throat> employed under what's the statute? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, under 15 4 202. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make an amendment if possible. 
Okay. And uh, remind us where that goes, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'd like to amend on page three, lines 10 and 11. So we would delete the, the current language and replace it with managers of any county or municipality employed under 154202. Right. And, and Mr. Chairman, just to note that um, that statute would only apply to municipalities. It would not apply. Um, that section does not apply to counties. Yeah. So, we, yeah, we shouldn't. It would be, uh, Mr. Chairman, on page three, lines 10 and 11, we would insert the language managers of municipal of any municipality in Wyoming employed under 154202. Got it. Is there a second? Second by Washit. Any discussion on the proposed amendment? Any discussion? Shall we move to a vote? All in favor of the proposed amendment on page three lines 10 and 11, please raise your hand and keep them up. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, it's unanimous. Okay, that amendment passes. There, is there other discussion on this bill before we go to a vote? Representative Gray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just want to clarify again one, one thing on the definition of personnel file. Right now, it is not defined. Okay. So, right now, the status quo is that it's not defined. And, and I'm sure that's litigated. I mean, that was brought up in our testimony from last time. So, I, I think whether or not we create this carve out for performance ratings. I, I don't think the definition of personnel file should should sink. It should mean the bill is not a good bill. I mean, I, I think, you know, certainly the at a future point, it seems like we've crossed the Rubicon on amendments. I mean, that that, that could be a discussion. But um, I think that the status quo right now is the personnel file is not defined and it's exempt from the Public Records Act. So it's a, a, a question for the court right now. And so to make that a reason to uh, think the bill to say it's not ready for prime time or hasn't been vetted enough. I, I just really, I don't agree with that, with that, uh, with that notion. Co-Chairman Nethercott. And your mic's not on. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman. I, I have an amendment for, for clarity. On page six, line 21, when we reference um, specified public employees, I'd like to, instead of having that word specified, that we um, refer it to the positions above in some other way. And looking for Mr. Fuller, just because my first read on the the, the additional language, it's. On page, on page, starting on page six, line 17, it says for all employees of a government entity and provides that kind of protection for every employee about unwar unwarranted invasions of personal privacy. But then it says, here's what is disclosed for the specified public employees. And so you're kind of transitioning from two concepts when you're reading a statute. So from a person who's trying to apply it, um, it there might be an easier way to make the statute just more cl clear. So Mr. Fuller, do you think that's easy to do where we can just say the specified and referencing to the four categories above? Mr. Chairman, Chairman Nethercott, my suggestion would be after specified public employees on line 21, insert who are defined in WS 16-4-201-A-16. That is my motion, Mr. Co-Chairman. Is there a second? Second by Senator Cost. Any discussion on the Madam Co-Chairman's amendment? On page six, line 21, any discussion? All in favor of the amendment, please raise your hands and keep them up. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, it's unanimous, the amendment passes. Any further suggestions for amendments or discussion before we move to a vote? Anything else? Are we ready to vote? Call for the question. Question has been called for. Mary Beth, would you please call the roll? 
This return is a roll call vote on 21 LSO 163 version 6 as amended. Senator Anselmi Hill. Aye. Senator Bummer. Aye. Senator Foss. Aye. Senator Von Slater. Aye. Representative Burlingame. Aye. Representative Gray. Aye. Representative Jennings. Aye. Representative Tuff. Aye. Representative Palmer. No. Representative Salazar. Aye. Representative Stitt. Aye. Representative Washington. Aye. Co-Chairman Nedergott. Aye. Co-Chairman Kirkbride. Aye. Mr. Chairman, that passes. Okay, very good. We're almost on time here, folks. So why don't we take a 10 minute break and we'll resume uh, shortly. Let's see, I have 11.02. So we'll resume at 11.12 with the public contracting issues discussion. But uh, until then we are in recess.
I'm back on, so. I think we could start back up, folks. And Mary Beth, maybe you could admit the people in the uh, waiting room sure, into the meeting room and uh, we'll get going. I wanted to want to say thank you to the subcommittee who worked on the last bill. It's always uh, gratifying when a subcommittee works hard and does something uh, productive like you did. So thanks, those of you who are worked on that. We've got another good subcommittee effort coming tomorrow as well. So our 11 o'clock session, public contracting issues, and Mr. Hopkinson has the introduction to that bill. So David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, David Hopkinson with the Legislative Service Office, uh, <clears throat> providing an overview of 21 LSO 221 working draft 0 0.5, Public Works Contracting Requirements dash Amendments. This bill comes before the committee uh, from the discussion that we had at the last uh, meeting. Uh, the committee did vote uh, to have LSO draft this legislation based on that discussion and based on uh, the memorandum that was provided uh, from the working group. Um, <clears throat> on page one is, is the beginning of a staff comment. I'm going to come back to that. That's primarily just considerations for the committee uh, as, as we go over this bill that will come up uh, as we discuss it. On page three is where we start getting into the bill itself. Uh, the first item uh, amends section or statute 923004. And what this is doing on lines five through nine is creating a new paragraph in subsection C. And this is referring to the state construction department and simply provides uh, for them to adopt rules for the pre-qualifications of bidders on contracts as provided in a subsection or a new subsection that we'll see in a few pages. Um, and it limits those uh, pre-qualification rules uh, as those except for those that are already under the jurisdiction of the Transportation Commission pursuant to Wyoming Statute 24-108A. Further down, we see some conforming amendments in Wyoming Statute 923006, uh, and that is simply conforming that to this new uh, law. Uh, the same thing at the bottom of the page in 15.1.113 is some conforming amendments with that new subsection T 
uh, that would provide the provisions of Wyoming Statute 166119, which we'll see here in a moment, uh, apply and control over this amended section. On page four, um, <clears throat> we start getting into the meat of the bill. And it amends Wyoming Statute 166107, uh, creating some new subsections. Uh, the first new subsection we see there is at the bottom lines 18 through 22 subsection B. And this is addressing uh, the sole source supplier requirements. Uh, and, and what this section is doing is requiring that each public entity specify performance standards for materials and, and equipment. <clears throat> it allows that they can specify as suggested individual brands or manufacturers, um, provided that they will not, uh, that similar to, provided that similar or materials or equipment that meet those same uh, specifications shall be accepted unless, and on page five, uh, paragraphs one through three, each of these uh, exceptions would have to be complied with. One, that the contract is for an existing public work Two, that the substitution of materials or equipment is impractical. And three, that the specified materials and equipment to be procured are not furniture or movable equipment. Uh, and this is simply kind of a conforming amendment in Wyoming Statute 17.6.1001, which has its own requirements. Um, so this is just providing that those would control. On <clears throat> further down on page five, uh, again, more of the meat of this bill. Um, it amends Wyoming Statute 166.119 by creating new subsections. We see those starting on page six. The subsection B addresses the pre-qualification requirements and a, and a blanket pre-qualification. Provides that uh, each public entity shall accept a bidder or respondent as pre-qualified if the bidder or respondent has been determined to be qualified pursuant to rules promulgated either by the State Transportation Commission or uh, the State Construction Department, whichever um, rules would be applicable to that particular public work. Subsection C <clears throat> provides that uh, a public entity can't reject uh, a, a, a bidder or respondent based solely on their financial strength so long as they have sufficient bid payment or performance bonds through a surety company approved by that public entity. And subsection D, uh, this is designed to address the, the balanced bidding uh, that was discussed, uh, provides that no public entity shall accept a bid if it determines that any of the unit bid prices are significantly unbalanced to the potential detriment of the public entity. On page seven, uh, again, we see some uh, conforming and clarifying amendments. Uh, Wyoming Statute 166120 is amended. Um, under Wyoming Statute 166, uh, the, the general rulemaking is provided by the Department of Workforce Services. Uh, and so this is just specifying or clarifying that uh, the new rules with respect to pre-qualification requirements uh, aren't to be addressed by the workforce services. They'll be addressed by uh, the specific entity, either the Department of uh, the State Construction Department or the Transportation Commission. On Wyoming Statute 21.3.1.10 is amended again, just in conforming amendments. We see that on page eight, line 12. And what these conforming amendments are, are doing uh, are, is simply to clarify that while a, a pub, one of the specific public entities typically would be able to reject a bid um, or waive irregularities, et cetera, that those are uh, subject to the new requirements uh, that we've seen in um, 16.6.119, that those would be applicable. The bottom of page eight, Again, conforming amendments in 24.1.132 that we see made on page nine, lines four and five. 
Um, at the bottom of page nine, we begin the uh, conforming and clarifying amendment in 4110.113, which shows up at the end, uh, actually on page 12, uh, providing that the provisions of the new Wyoming six statute 176.119 apply to, to this paragraph and any conflicts. Uh, that statute would control. Section two uh, requires rulemaking by the State Transportation Commission and the State Construction Department. Uh, it does set a deadline of July 1st, 2021. One thing the committee may wish to consider is, is if that is enough time. Uh, and then section three provides a split effective date to allow for the rulemaking. Um, <clears throat> jumping back to the staff comment there's some bullet points there for the committee's consideration of whether or not they want to leave things as they are in the bill draft or, or um, address those specifically or, or make any amendments. Um, and, and the committee can go over those. But with that, I would stand for any questions. Any questions for Mr. Hopkinson? Representative Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question pertains to page five, line seven to eight, where we have an exemption for specifying uh, particular brands, uh, and it includes the word impractical. And when I looked at that word on my online dictionary, uh, among the synonyms available was merely inconvenient. Uh, and I hope that uh, we're, we're looking for something here more than mere inconvenience for the agency before they can specify a particular brand in their bid. So my question is, is there case law or someplace else where impractical is uh, defined? Mr. Hopkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Washett, <clears throat> I frankly have not looked at that particular issue, so I'm not sure I'd be happy to do that research for the committee. Uh, I think that language was kind of pulled from the memo. Uh, so as far as that definition in, in, in any case law, at this point, I'm not aware. Perhaps Mr. Fuller could comment. Mr. Mr. Fuller? Mr. Chairman, Representative Washett, um, you know, I, I too have not have not looked into to that. The one thing I would note with the language, though, on page five, um, is that the in order to accept that accept substitute um, to to not accept a you know more effective cost effective substitute is that it has to meet all three of those bullet of those paragraphs on page five. Um, so so that that language on line seven and eight does not stand. Um, by itself, it's, it's one of three that must be satisfied. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Hopkinson? Senator Von Flader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hopkinson on page six, you mentioned the State Transportation Commission twice in that paragraph on B page uh, line five and line 10. Is there a reason that you bring it up now, even though you said it's they're exempt from this? So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Von Flader, um, that sub, uh, subsection uh, is addressing, I think, two, two different issues, the reason we have it there twice is, is that first sentence I think is, is clarifying that the state transportation commission will, will have the opportunity or, or can def, will define what a specialty project is uh, or will determine what, what qualifies as a specialty project. Um, and then the second mention there is that, that they will be promulgating rules to determine um, free qualification. Uh, so I'm, the, the Transportation Commission isn't, I don't, I don't think this is exempting anything. Um, I guess I'm not quite clear perhaps on what the question is, but that's the reason I think that they're mentioned there twice is addressing two separate issues. 
in that paragraph or subsection. Senator Von Plater. Uh, let me follow up when I say the I'll have to find that in the bill, but it does exempt the Highway Commission from um, from following these. But I will um, excluding those public works under jurisdiction of. So it's line seven, page three. It, said, it says excluding those public works under the jurisdiction of the State Transportation Commission. Is that what? I don't know why you mentioned it twice, and that's the only place you mention it in the bill is on page um, six. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Von yeah. Plater, so in on page three, what it's doing there is that language is referring to or amending the duties of the state construction department. Um, and so the purpose of paragraph 10, or <clears throat> is to provide or authorize the state construction department to adopt these rules for pre-qualification, um, but limit their jurisdiction of pre-qualification rules simply to any public work, except for those that are under the jurisdiction of the State Transportation Commission. Um, so the, the exclusion there is simply that the the state construction department adopts the rules for public works, except for what the state transportation commission is adopting, uh, pursuant to their statute. There, um, on page six, um, that's just requiring them to adopt those pre-qualification rules, um, depending on whether it's going to be the state transportation. Commission or the State Construction Department, um, which is determined either by kind of the State Construction Department has general jurisdiction except for what the State Transportation Commission has. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, maybe I'm just not seeing it. And I apologize. Senator Von Fleiter. Mr. Hawkinson, I think, I think the, uh, except for page or uh, line four on that page six, where it says, except for specialty projects, requirements is determined by the rule of the State Transportation Commission. Um, I think specialty projects would probably uh, uh, say that the State Transportation Commission um, shall accept a bidder or respondent as pre-qualified for a contract for public works if the bidder or respondent has been determined to be pre-qualified pursuant to rules promulgated by the State Transportation Commission. I don't know why they drug them in, but that's the only place they've drug them in. But it is for a specialty project, and I think that is the reason for the, having to write rules and regulations. So I'm good. All right. Representative Jennings. Okay, he's going to pass. Any other questions for Mr. Hopkinson before we launch into the public comment? Senator Von Flater? It has to do at the very end. Um, on page 12, it says, um, section 3 says, on uh, line 14, except as providing subsection B of this section, this act is effective July 1st. And then it has a little b, and it says sections two and three of this act are effective immediately. I was curious as to why three had to be put in there. Section two and three of this act are effective immediately when section three says it's immediate, immediately, or except as provided in subsection b of this section, this act is effective July 1, but it says three is effective immediately. Mr. Hopkinson. Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Fuller might have a comment on that. Okay, Mr. Fuller. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Senator Von Flader, uh, I think about a year ago or so, it was decided that um, to, to be absolutely clear about when certain sections take effect, uh, 
really what it comes down to is that there was a question about if you know if the if the effective date section isn't also effective immediately that somehow made you know, the other section not effective immediately um, so it's just it's just meant to kind of you know dot the i's and cross the t's uh, you know to make sure that rulemaking is an, is indeed effective immediately Sandra? Okay. I'm good. I'm good. All right. Anybody else have questions for Mr. Hopkinson, Representative Washett? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Back on page five, um, where the bill is talking about uh, movable equipment on line 11, um, has that specified anywhere? What exactly? It seems like that, again, is a very uh, broad term, movable equipment could be lots of uh, fairly expensive items, including computers and motor vehicles and radios and so forth. Uh, is that defined anywhere? Mr. Chairman, Representative Washington, I'm just pulling up the statute that, that it's referring to there, 166-101. I do, my recollection is that it is, or at least somewhat specified there. Um, but the, the reason for that language in this bill is because it, it does come from that statute. And so it's kind of conforming to that existing statute. Um, this, Pulling up. My short answer, I suppose, in the interest of time is, is simply that that's existing statute, uh, that language. So whether or not it's defined may be an issue we want to address. But okay. if the committee would give me just a moment, I can certainly look at that. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Looks like we're ready to move on to public comment. So we'll first call on Mr. McLaurin from the Association of Municipalities. Welcome, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Bob McLaurin with WAM. Um, and we, not sure if we like this bill, um, but uh, prepared to work with, uh, with the contractors, the legislature to try to, to make it work. I did have a question about the pre-qualification. Um, so is it that the state department of construction and the highway commission or the department of transportation are going to create the pre-qualification list for all the cities and towns and counties and anybody that's on that list are, are qualified to bid for a, uh, for a public project? That would be my first question. Good question. Who wants to? Does that go back to Mr. Hopkinson? No, Representative Stith? Mr. Chairman, Mr. McLaurin, it is my understanding that the intention of this is to do exactly what you've described, that if you have, you have kind of have a one-stop shop for pre-qualification, and the reason it's to split between the Department of Transportation on the one hand and uh, the state construction department and the other is that the Department of Transportation already has essentially a pre-qualification scheme for horizontal construction, but doesn't have a similar scheme for say constructing buildings, for example, or what we think is vertical construction. And so what, we, what is new about this would be, it would be a new task for the state construction department, I think, to develop that. Uh, and the idea is to uh, say that if you're good enough for the state, then you're good enough for, you know, the town of Glenrock, for example. I think that's the, that's the idea. If that answers your question. Thank you, Representative Stipp, it does. I, and I had, Mr. Chairman, I have one more question if I might. Certainly. Um, on page five, um, line 20, um, it says to determine qualifications and responsibilities of bidders or respondents on contracts or public works and may reject any and all bids or responses based on the qualifications and responsibilities of bidders and respondents. So hypothetically, if a city, if there's a contractor um, 
that's on the state list, but a city's had a bad experience with them, you know, um, is that grounds to be able to disqualify him if he's a low bidder on previous experience? Good question. We're thinking, Mr. McLaren. Representative Stith. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, Mr. McLaren. Uh, I think that the if this is adopted, then even if the city or town has had a bad experience with the contractor, if they are deemed to be uh, pre-qualified by and meet the standards of the state construction department, then the city or town would be forced to accept a contractor they don't like if they are the little bidder. I think that's what, what this would mean. Thank you, sir. Good. Mr. Chairman, I don't have anything else at this point. Okay. Any questions for Mr. McLaurin? Madam Co-Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman. I think Mr. McLaurin uh, identified an important point um, and an area that I think deserves maybe some attention. Mr. McLaurin, as you got that question answered for, for you from Representative Stith, do you have any suggestions on, on maybe a way to remedy that concern? I mean, I do support any government entity's ability to not go with the low, lowest bidder just because they're approved through the, through the state if they've had bad experiences, right? I mean, that shouldn't, that actual known quantity of a bad experience shouldn't be disregarded by the entity um, as a result of meeting these procedural um, qualifications. So do you have any solutions there? Buying you time by talking too much. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Mr. McCart. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Nelica, I don't have any specific language. Um, uh, I appreciate the intent of the bill, but a lot of our projects, we're working downtowns in tight quarters with merchants that are losing money. Um, every day the streets close. And so it's important that contractors, you know, have good working relationships, but I don't have a specific example, but it's a real concern for us when we get into these, you know, downtown projects that really impact a lot of people. Anything else committee? Okay, Mr. McLaren, thank you for your time with us this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's move to Mr. Riemann. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of Wyoming's County Commissioners. I appreciate uh, your time. Uh, we certainly understand the intent and, and want to uh, work with the committee. Um, and as I stated uh, during my testimony in August, uh, we, uh, we do think this could be beneficial uh, to counties uh, and contractors uh, across the state. Still continue to be rather concerned uh, about putting uh, the state construction department uh, and the Department of Transportation uh, into a leadership role, into a regulatory role over uh, counties uh, when uh, currently they have none. Um, and I'm concerned uh, that the bill uh, in a lot of respects uh, presumes uh, that YDOT and construction department uh, uh, project requirements are a one-to-one -one match uh, with county projects. Uh, I'll just give a few examples where uh, the state uh, has little or no uh, expertise in building uh, projects that counties are otherwise uh, involved in. That includes uh, airports, county roads, uh, recreational facilities, uh, fairgrounds, hospitals, uh, sewer projects, uh, and uh, firehouses. Now, one could say, well, those are just construction projects. Uh, you know, they're all the same. But I think that that uh, is uh, an unfair uh, assumption, and we know it's certainly not the case. Um, one concern that my members uh, have, that I have, uh, is that uh, YDOT, uh, uh, for example, is responsible for adhering to state and federal uh, road standards that counties otherwise aren't uh, adherent to, and they shouldn't be. Uh, in fact, those standards 
would often require uh, counties to expend far more money uh, than they should otherwise have to. Uh, and that's certainly something that we can't afford to do uh, in our current uh, environment. Uh, again, I am, uh, and we are supportive uh, of the concept and we wanna work with you. Uh, so instead of requiring uh, these state agencies uh, to put in place standards uh, and lord down on uh, counties, we would ask uh, that you perhaps look at a concept that would have counties uh, develop uh, those uh, particular standards uh, for pre-qualification. Now, somebody might say, well, you're going to end up with perhaps 23 different standards, and I don't think that has to be the case. Uh, I think there is a pathway here uh, where we could uh, define uniformity uh, across uh, those counties. Some other uh, issues that uh, we have with the current construct of the bill is that there's no requirement uh, for YDOT uh, or the construction department to consult with anyone, uh, in particular uh, local governments, which will ultimately be uh, in part uh, responsible for uh, adhering to these. Second, there's no uh, responsibility for those agencies to consider the laws and regulations that are imposed on counties uh, when they're constructing the various projects uh, that they're otherwise uh, intended to do. The risk in all of this uh, for counties is that we pre-qualify a bidder for a project they have no reasonable expertise or qualifications to build. Uh, and second, we make projects uh, more expensive uh, to construct. Uh, again, uh, we remain uh, willing to work with you. We want to work with you. I hope I've offered some constructive ideas uh, and uh, we'll be happy to stand for any questions that the committee may have. Representative Gray has questions. Um, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, Representative Stith can go ahead or whoever is next. I, I'll, I'll wait a second. Thank you. Okay, Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Ryman, uh, the, uh, on page six, line four of the proposed bill, there's an exception for specialty project requirements as determined by rule of the State Transportation Commission or the State Construction Department. Uh, is your concern, for example, that the Transportation Department or Construction Department would not uh, exempt out water treatment plants, for example, and then someone who's qualified to build a, a student dorm or a courthouse might then deemed qualified to build a water treatment plant. Is that, is that your heartburn with this? Mr. 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 Chairman, Representative Stiff, I think you're getting absolutely to the heart of that. And, and if uh, we can define that in rule and regulation, perhaps uh, that will help. But again, there's no requirement in here that these entities consult with us uh, in that uh, rulemaking process or to consider uh, our particular standards uh, as part of that. Okay, we had Representative Gray and then Senator Von Flater. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Riemann, so, you know, on this point about uh, the state being subject or to, to federal rules and regulations, I, I think you were talking about horizontal construction more, um, but vertical construction potentially too, and that if the state were developing rules um, for prequal that by extension, it could make the locality subject to federal uh, laws and regulations. I mean, I assume that's page three lines four to nine, and I'm just not reading that there. I think that's saying that they're creating pre-qualifications uh, for, for uh, public works for municipalities. And I think it's kind of understood there that um, that's probably gonna be a little bit different than for the state per se. It's not necessarily putting them into the same batch. And I don't think that was the intention at all, because you're right that there are some things that the localities aren't subject to. Um, I'm just, I just think that that language is supposed to create 
a standard for the localities and the agency is going to help going to going to be required to to do that through the rulemaking process but um is that where you're reading that and and do you disagree with me mr raymond mr chairman uh, representative gray i appreciate uh, the question i think the concern uh, the fear uh, that local governments have or the counties in my uh, instance is that uh, these uh, state agencies uh, are re responsible for state or federal projects uh, across the state. So their expertise pulls from those. So there's going to be a perhaps a natural tendency uh, that they will uh, consider those to be appropriate standards when you apply them to particular projects. When in our case, uh, uh, you know, I used the example of county roads, perhaps that uh, could be applied uh, for uh, for uh, building projects uh, that you would end up with standards uh, requirements uh, in the bidding uh, or uh, qualifying uh, particular entities uh, that uh, aren't uh, uh, you know adherent to those perhaps lower standards that counties might otherwise uh, be looking to or perhaps in some cases to uh, higher standards uh, for those specialty uh, projects that might exist out there. And so uh, perhaps we can, uh, through the, the recommendations that I uh, provided by uh, one, having to consult uh, with uh, local governments and two, uh, having to consider uh, those various standards would help to ad uh, address that. Uh, but my first priority would be to allow local governments, uh, allow counties in my instance again, uh, to do that on their own. Uh, we don't need uh, the state to uh, become our overlord on this issue. Uh, Representative Gray. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to make sure, that I, thanks, that was helpful. Um, so your concern is not that the legal language puts you into the same batch as state projects, that it's acknowledged there that it could be a different set of standards, pre-qual standards for localities. Your concern is that through practice, the agencies has gotten used to uh, implementing and requiring the, the what's required in federal statute and that they won't, because of their practice, they, they won't remove those things when considering this lo local pre-qual process. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative yeah. Gray, uh, that's correct. Uh, and, and again, we understand uh, the intent of this and, and support the concept. Do think that it could help us, uh, could help contractors as well. Just think that uh, we have a disagreement in the approach. Senator Von Flader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Raymond, on line 19, page five, line 19 through 23, Continuing on page six, lines one and two, doesn't, doesn't that give you that warm, fuzzy feeling that we're trying to do the correct thing? Every public entity shall be authorized to determine the qualifications and responsibilities of bidders. Is that the same thing? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Von Flader, and I, I don't know that I would uh, say that this gives me warm and fuzzy feelings. Uh, uh, again, if we could control our destiny and, and uh, do that in a uniform way that helps contractors and counties, uh, th then I think that uh, we would feel better about this. But right now, uh, we're inserting two state agencies, which again, have no uh, current, uh, in most instances, there are uh, some uh, particular instances, but in most instances with linear and, and vertical projects uh, have no responsibility to local governments as it stands today. Anything else for the counties? Anything else? Representative Gray? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Mr. Riemann, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of recalling here the last few minutes that to the, the nexus of this bill, which was a meeting that was in, I think, July or August. Um, and one of the examples we got in that, in that meeting was that, well, in Laramie County, one of the pre-qual requirements for a courthouse there was that uh, 
anyone working on this renovation was that they had to work on five courthouses in the last, I think it was like 10 years or something. And maybe it was even less than that. And that basically excluded everybody, any entity in the state of Wyoming. And even the, the entity that had, the, that had built the courthouse couldn't renovate it because they didn't meet that pre-qualification. <laughs> requirements. So the intent of this is to actually do the reverse. And I understand there are consequences to bills, but, you know, I guess, and maybe it's a broader question. I mean, we're talking about pre-qualifications here, not the actual decision. So to say that, I mean, it was really more about the fact that entities had thought that that localities had tried with very specific pre-quals to exclude um, and make it more difficult for Wyoming uh, work to be done on these projects. So, I mean, I, I understand you're giving your angle on it, but I, do you have any response to that? Mr. Freeman? Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, I wanna just be clear. Uh, I wasn't uh, a party to that uh, conversation in July. Uh, uh, and that's neither here nor there. Uh, and I think the project that you speak to is not a county project. In fact, I think it was a city project. Uh, uh, and nobody has uh, suggested that, uh, at least to me, uh, to this point, uh, that uh, there is an example where counties uh, have, have uh, had harm here. But uh, nonetheless, I'm not saying uh, that there should not be standards uh, in place, that we shouldn't have uh, some uniform way ago, uh, to go about uh, of putting in place, uh, uh, you know, these pre-qualifications so that uh, entities, uh, you know, again, that's both a benefit to the county because they're going to know who might be able to qualify for the particular project that they're going to uh, put out to bid. They're also going to have, uh, or the contractors uh, would benefit from that. So uh, again, I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be standards. I'm just uh, suggesting there should be uh, or there's a difference in who should be writing those standards uh, uh, as we move forward. And, and from my perspective, uh, for counties, that should be counties. Representative Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Raymond, if we were to change the language here and instead of having these state agencies driving the bus, but rather put it upon the counties and the municipalities to use the YDOT model and create your own set of uniform standards for a statewide application. Is that something that would be feasible or do you see the counties not working well enough together that the 23 counties could come up with a uniform set of standards that were modeled after the YDOT approach? Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Representative Washett, uh, I do think that's a possibility, absolutely. Uh, there are a number of frameworks from which we might be able to uh, develop these standards. Uh, I do believe that there is uh, the strong potential for the counties as 23 counties uh, to work on a uniform uh, set of requirements. Uh, you know, in fact, that's what our association is about, uh, is trying to bring uh, uniformity around issues to clarify those for your purposes. So I, I do think that that's possible and that that is what I am suggesting in my testimony today. Anything else for Mr. Riemann? Anything else? Okay, thank you for your input to the committee. Let's hear next from Ms. Ligurski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Katie Ligurski with the Contractors Association, and I do have a couple of individuals with me. I have Kenny McKillop, who's on Zoom. He's a contractor in Northeast Wyoming, and I also have Mark Matson, who's with a local engineering firm here in Cheyenne to answer a number of questions that may be posed. We do appreciate this committee looking at the concerns that the contractors across the state of Wyoming has mainly due to the fact that oftentimes the pre-qualification from the city, towns and counties and other public entities are so stringent 
that contractors cannot be pre qualified to bid on a bill. What this bill does is that it does set a pre-qualification process for both horizontal and vertical contractors. And I think there's a lot of confusion surrounding the difference between a pre-qualification process and design standards. This does not address design standards for the difference of building a county road versus building a, building a state road. It only addresses the pre-qualification on the contractor whether they're eligible to bid on that project or not. Um, and Mark Matson will be happy to go into a little more detail on the differences between a pre-qualification process and design standards. We do have a couple of quick concerns regarding this bill um, that I would like to share with you. On page six, line nine, we would like to see the words inserted following pre-qualified. I mean, pre yeah, pre qual that says for the type of work we would like. So, in other words, on page nine, no, excuse me, page six, line nine, have it read predetermined to be pre qualified for the type of work pursuant to the rules. What that means is obviously using <clears throat> the Transportation Commission pre qualification process through YDOT that they will pre qualify contractors, but in order to allow a certain type of contractor to bid on a project. Obviously, we do not want a fencing contractor to be allowed to bid on an asphalt type of contract because they're not pre-qualified to do asphalt work. They're only qualified to do fencing work. So I think we do need to add for that type of work to make sure that contractors are qualified or pre-qualified in the form of the type of work that they do, not anything across the board. We also do have just a question on page six, line 19 where it says that a surety company will be approved by the public entity. Um, as we all know, there aren't any surety companies in the state of Wyoming, majority of them are out of state. And we just wanted to know who was compiling that list of surety out there if each individual public entities would be doing that. It would be the Department of Insurance who would be compiling that list so that we know if we have an approved surety and bonding agency out there to use. And then we also do have concerns on page six with number D that talks about bids being unbalanced and significantly unbalanced. Um, we do believe that pretty much all bids are considered unbalanced for a number of reasons. And we need, would like to see a definition of what exactly significantly unbalanced means because we believe this is very broad across the port. And I'll turn it over to Kenny McKillop to explain exactly why we believe almost all bids are unbalanced. Mr. McKillop. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, so the uh, the tough part for me on the unbalanced bid process is that uh, like a key example of, of unbalancing a bid, uh, traffic control is a great example uh, where you have a lump sum traffic control item and then you have a flagging hours item and you may have one traffic control subcontractor that puts his flagging hours at a, a penny an hour and then and he assumes the risk of those hours and puts the quantity the actual cost of that flagging into his lump sum item and then you have a the other contractor won't do that and so his his unit price is at fifty dollars an hour for that same flagging hour so does that constitute unbalanced if the guy that's $50 an hour ends up being the low bid, even though he's, you know, he's $50 an hour versus a penny. Uh, it's, it's very broad. And, and it's, uh, there's just, there's no, <clears throat> uh, no good description of, of what we're looking at there. And, and kind of going back to to means and methods of, of how everything's already bid in in pretty much any public works project that you're going to bid nowadays in the instructions the bidders uh, essentially the same pretty close to the same verbiage as uh, this bill has in page uh, six and seven lines 19 and uh, 19 down to page seven, line two, uh, like Mr. Von Flattern <clears throat> addressed, that's that a, a version of that uh, language is already in every bid that we bid. And so this bill, this bill isn't 
I, I don't see where we need to where we need to dig any deeper into that. Um, it's already there. It's already in statute that you can you can reject any and all bids for essentially any reason or no reason at all. Um, and so that would go. I, I would point that towards the previous testimony as well. And in, in the question that was posed on, does this mean that a uh, city entity will have to hire a contractor that they've had performance issues with? The only thing that this, as far as I see it, the only thing that this bill um, does is it gives anybody that's qualified with the state the right to bid the project. It doesn't touch on whether they have to be uh, it doesn't it doesn't touch on the award of that project uh, so if what it what it's doing is it's it's protecting me as drm from being disqualified because i haven't put in enough footage of pipe of uh, this particular size of pipe in the last 10 years it still allows me to bid that job but this bill doesn't touch on the fact that you have to award me the job if I'm the low bid, it just says you have to allow me to bid the job. And so I don't see where the balanced bidding, uh, I, I guess, number one, I don't see where that makes us or makes the entity have to hire somebody that they have performance issues with, for example. I also don't see where it, it says that you have to accept a unbalanced bid that you have issues with, legitimate issues with. I can tell you that in my 12 years of estimating um, <clears throat> and probably putting out 100 to 150 estimates a, a year, I've, this, this uh, verbiage has always been in all the contracts I've seen it enacted one time. So I don't see that it's a big issue that we need to dive farther into. I think it's more of an educational thing with the entities um, and, and writing more statute, I don't know, fixes your educational issue. That's all I have. Good. Uh, Senator Von Plater. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is to Mr. McKillop. So if somebody had mobilization in there and had three quarters of their price on mobilization and got paid that up front, would that be an unbalanced bid? Mr. McKillop? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Von Flatter. So under, under today's current bidding structure, um, and I guess more specifically basis of payments, you can't, you can't do that anymore because the mobilization is paid out based on a percentage of project complete, meaning uh, the, the way that the uh, specifications are written is uh, zero, to, zero to say 10% of the project complete, you get paid 5% of your mobile. And then 10 to 25%, they bump it up to 20% of your mold. And it systematically goes up like that as the project is completed. So, um, so it's not really possible anymore in today's day to, to get 100% of your mold or 50% of your mold prior to starting the work. Senator Von Flater. Thank you. Mr. McKillop, I didn't know that. I thought that because I'd worked for private entities before I always got my mobilization up front. Good. Representative Stiff. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, for Mr. McKillop, it, your comments about balanced bidding seem to make some sense with respect to horizontal construction where the procedures currently in place by most of the entities uh, alleviate, ameliorate that problem. Uh, I'd like you to ask you to address with respect to vertical construction, however, and specifically, my question is this, the current draft of the bill only talks about accepting or rejecting a bid. What if we uh, change that language in subsection D on the end of page six and early of page seven? What if we, what if we added to that, and this is especially with respect to vertical construction, that successful bidders shall ensure that any schedule of values required to be submitted for the project shall contain similar cost values for similar work. Would that cause you any heartburn? And the reason I suggest that language and raise that point is that for vertical construction, it seems say building a college dorm, for example, the public entity 
puts out the specifications. And then when the bids are open, because the specifications are already so precise, it might just be a number like $12 million is what we're, we're going to build this dorm for you for $12 million. And then later as part of the contract administration, the contractor submits a so-called schedule of values where they then later provide uh, their values associated with each part of the work. And if we added a, a phrase that said, that addressed this issue during the administration of the contract, would that cause you any heartburn? Mr. McKillop. Uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, Representative Stiff. No, I, I don't see where that would cause us any heartburn. Um, essentially, you're just moving the process of the schedule of values from after award to, to pre-award, I guess you'd say. So no, I, I don't see where that, that causes any issues. Okay. So we still have uh, Ms. Ligurski and Mr. Madsen, Mr. McKillop with us, Senator Von Flatern. Thank you. I was going to address uh, Ms. Ligurski's comment about the line 19 through a surety company approved by the public entity. I would assume that is a single, at the time, the public entity could determine whether the surety company is good or bad. And that is how I take that sentence. I don't take it as we're gathering all these surety companies in some place they're going to be. Uh, we have to look it up and say, oh, they're accepted by this group. So I think that's what that sentence says. Ms. Ligurski, is that reassuring? I, I do appreciate that. We were just concerned that each public entity would have their own surety list out there instead of them just being approved from the Department of Insurance. But it does. And I do have Mr. Matson here, if you guys would like a little explanation on the difference between design standards versus pre-qualification standards. Certainly, we'd like to hear from him. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Mark Madsen, WHS Engineering. Um, yeah, I, I just got a sense that maybe there was a little um, concern that pre-qualification and design standards are the same thing, which they're certainly not. So, and, and maybe Mr. Fulton, as he speaks, could talk about this, but, you know, we absolutely understand that you've got the Rural Roads Design Guide that, that would pretty much dictate many county roads um, and low volume and you, all of the people that design this you know carry that liability about public safety first and we understand that but that doesn't really apply towards pre-qualification rules um, so I hope that that just sort of clarifies that these these two things really have nothing to do with each other um, because I, I, I got a sense that there would be some concern about increased cost if you're building a Hall Road or a agriculture county farm to market road like an interstate. Well, we wouldn't do that. Those, you know, the, the design guides are completely different for those complete roads. And so I just wanted to clarify that. There was one question that I had on trying to define unbalanced bidding. And, and I'm gonna speak about a contractor because they no longer exist, it's kind of fair. Star Aggregates here had a massive pile of crusher reject material. And they bid a job to give that away because frankly, they're a mile from the project and it's reject material. And it was outside the roadway prism. So, so it was a place where they could perfectly drop that. And so their price didn't make any sense. They were given um, the ability to get rid of waste material. If you take the I-80 and college um, on and off ramps, you'll see this massive amount of material and it was huge, but it was great for the state, and, you know, and, but their price wouldn't have made any sense. So I guess I just need to make sure that there's always that thought that somebody should at least check if you see an unbalanced bid item, that maybe there's a real reason that you should consider it. And it wasn't for nefarious purposes. Good. Anything else for these folks? I don't see any other questions. Contractors, thank you. That's good input. Appreciate the help. We have also on our list at uh, wanting to speak, Mr. Fulton. 
from why not I, I there's a couple names on there but you're the one that's here and so happy to hear from you sir uh, thank you mr uh, chairman uh, keith fulton assistant chief engineer wyoming department of transportation um, for us um, you know uh, a few uh, we uh, had a similar concern on line nine nine line 19 of page six with the uh, approved by a public entity um, but i think that was addressed um, and, or that could even read as, as approved um, as, you know, a company that is licensed to uh, work in the state of Wyoming could be even a, another alternate there. Um, for us, it wouldn't be a lot of changes except, you know, to bring back maybe a comment from uh, Mr. Ryman. Um, you know, we, uh, we pre-call for the type of work that YDOT does. And, and there may be other types of work that the counties do that we don't cover. And that wouldn't be in part of our pre-qualification. So that would be additional a task for YDOT if we were to, have to take that on is, is looking for different types of work and it could be a lot more pre-qualification for us because there are a lot of contractors that don't bid YDOT work but they do bid other local uh, work and so that could be an additional task for us that maybe we'll get a lot more contractors trying to pre-qual which could you know slow down uh, our processes in, in that regards uh, but otherwise uh, I'm here just to answer any questions on the YDOT side and I uh, would agree with the previous comments about the um, design guides and prequal R2 districts. Representative Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fulton, thanks for being here today. You mentioned increasing your costs, and I think that's one of the things that uh, we're all very cautious of right now in terms of state government that uh, passing new statutes that are going to increase the workload for our state agencies or increase costs for our state agencies is something we want to minimize. Can you see how we might accomplish what this bill is trying to, to achieve uh, in a way that doesn't um, add more costs and burden onto your agency? Um, uh, Mr. Fulton. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative. Uh, you know, the one thought is, is whereas, uh, as previously discussed, is having the county set up their own um, pre-qualification standards uh, could be an option there. Um, or, you know, just taking the white out as is uh, would be another option there. And I'm not sure if that answers your question. Close enough. No, nope, thank you. Okay. Anything else from Mr. Fulton? Anything else? Any of these? Uh, they've given us some ideas on things they might like to change. Do we have a good grasp of that before we go into the amending process? Here's your chance to ask for some clarifications. Okay, Mr. Fulton, I think we're good. Thank I'm you. not seeing anyone else uh, new for public comment here. So seeing no one else, I'll close the public comment and bring the bill before the committee. Committee, what is your pleasure? Move the bill. Second. Moved by, moved by Berlin Game, seconded by Anselmi Dalton. Are there any suggestions for amendments to the bill? Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, yes, I would move uh, on page seven, line two, to add a new sentence <clears throat> that reads as follows. Successful bidders shall ensure that any schedule of values required to be submitted for the project shall contain similar cost values for similar work. Okay, seconded by Anselmi Dalton. Representative Stith, you want to explain that a little bit to us? Sure, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Yes, the, the current draft in subsection D that starts um, on the bottom of page six talks about the public entity rejecting the bid. Um, and I think that that sentence works pretty well for road construction or streets uh, because those projects are typically bid with unit prices, you know, so much for road base per cubic yard, so much for excavation, so much for asphalt, et cetera. For, for uh, building, for vertical projects where you're constructing a building like a college dorm, for example, where the 
unbalanced bidding becomes a problem is not at the bid stage. It's not the, the number uh, because the contractors, since the specifications for the building are so complete, sometimes the bid is just a number. Like I'll build this water treatment plant for you for $29 million or I'll build this college dorm for you for $12 million. Where the unbalanced bidding becomes a problem is in the administration of the project because one of the first things that happens in a project is that the contractor will submit its schedule of values to the uh, entity's representative, the engineer for approval. And it's that schedule of values that says, okay, for the first floor of the dorm, we're gonna charge you, you know, $8 million. And for the second and third floors, we're gonna charge you uh, $1 million each. And that's where you get into the unbalanced part. So this, what this would do right now, the current language uh, puts, the, uh, puts the responsibility on the entity not to accept a bid. This second sentence, this amendment, what it would do is it puts a requirement on the successful bidder to make sure that the schedule of value they submit to the, to the entity is, uh, is balanced. That's the purpose of it. All right. Any discussion on the amendment? Proposed amendment? Do you want to one more time read your wording, Representative Stith, to us? Mr. Chairman, yes. Uh, the new language would be as follows. Successful bidders shall ensure that any schedule of values required to be submitted for the project shall contain similar cost values for similar work. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on the, the amendment? Should we take it to a vote? All in favor of Representative Stiss amendment on page seven, line two, raise your hand and keep it raised. One, two, three. But I'm cap is Representative Jennings, that's a fist, is or is that a hand? Oh, that's a hand. Okay. That makes it unanimous. So I see 14 votes for uh, that amendment. Are there any other ideas for amendments to the bill? Representative Jennings. Mr. Chairman, my internet is good. Yes, we're not hearing you, Representative Jennings, which that may be in what you started to tell us. But let's go to Senator Von Flater next. Mr. Chairman, on page six on line nine, uh, work if the bidder or respondent has been determined to be pre-qualified for the type of work, I would insert the words for the type of work pursuant to rules promulgated by the State Transportation Commission. So, so the type of work would be inserted. A second? Second by Senator Cost. Any discussion on that, on that amendment on page six, line nine? Let's vote on the amendment. All in favor, please raise your hands so I can see them. Okay, I see we're, we're voting on the amendment on page six, line nine, Representative Jennings. Uh, to add uh, qualified for the type of work. I see everyone's hand up uh, except for Representative Jennings. So there's 12 eyes. All those opposed say no. Okay. Motion passes on that amendment. Are there other ideas for amendment? Senator Von Flater. Mr. Chairman, on line, well, this would be a new section on page six. It'd be right above the B that is now on line four. It'd be, and I'm not sure how to phrase this, but it'd be write a report as to why to not accept the lowest bidder. So, um, ex so on page five, line 19, it says, it starts out as, except as otherwise specified in this section, every public entity shall be authorized to determine qualifications and responsibilities of bidders or respondents on contracts for public works may reject any and all bids or response based on qualifications and responsibilities of bidders and responders and re-advertise for bids or responses. And I would put it a little section B, I'd put or and, I'm sorry, and at the end of line two, and I'd put write report as to why I do not accept lowest bidder my thought there is that they would get several people that would write in several times that this certain company 
was not a good company to deal with. That's my amendment is to write a report. And your amendment is just additional language onto subsection A on, on line two. It could be. It not could necessarily. Be, or it could be a new B section and okay. renumber. We'll get some advice from uh, the staff on which would be a better way to handle that. Was there a second to Senator Von Flatern's? Uh, Representative Pelkey with the second. All right. Uh, David or Brian, do you have a suggestion as to whether to attack that onto the end of subsection A or to make it its own subsection? Mr. Hopkinson. Mr. Chairman, uh, my initial impression will be just to tack it on to the end of A, but upon closer look, I suppose I might change my mind, but that's where I think initially I would prefer to have it. Okay. Why don't we think in those terms for now? Is there any further discussion on the proposed amendment? Oh, Mr. Fuller. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Von Flater, it, it may be helpful to, uh, the way I understood the language of the amendment is just that the, um, the public entity would write a report um, as to reasons for not accepting the lowest bid submitted. Um, I, I think the, the immediate questions that come to mind are, you know, what the, the disposition of that report um, is it posted? Is it published somewhere? Um, provided only to the bidder? Um, I think that would clarifying that may add um, may help make that sec that new language clearer. Okay. So, Senator Von yeah. Senator Von Flater. Um. Mr. Fuller, you wanted to say, write a report as to why I did not accept the lowest bidder to the, to somebody? Mr. Fuller? Mr. Chairman, Senator Von Flater, and I, I, I think that would help. I mean, right now, um, you know, the, the way I would understand that language is that it would just be writing a report and it's not clear um, where or to whom that, that report would go. And, and perhaps that is the intent, and if so, um, you know, certainly we have no opinion on that, but just, just to highlight that as a consideration for the committee. Senator Von Flater. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to include to the built to the state building commission. Right. To the end, to write the report to the state building commission. State construction department, excuse me, state construction department. Right. And Representative Pelkey, that works for you? Yep. Okay. Any further discussion on the proposed amendment? All those in favor, please raise your hand. See if it raised. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I see ten, four. Uh, all those opposed? I see one, two, three. Again, so that amendment passes. Any other ideas for amendments? Representative Washit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On uh, page five, line eight, I'd make a, uh, a propose an amendment to replace the word impractical with the word unworkable. Got it. Is there a second? Second by Burlingame. Anything uh, else about it, Representative Washington, we should know? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. My sense is that the word impractical oftentimes carries with it a, a fairly low threshold of um, concern. And, and I think that if you're going to specify that you have to have brand X equipment in, in a bid, that we should make sure that anything else would be unworkable and not just inconvenient. And so that's why I would suggest that the word unworkable conveys to the uh, language of the statute a more serious and, and a higher threshold um, for specifying a single source vendor. Okay. Very good. Any other comments, uh, discussion on Representative Washington's amendment? 
Seeing none, we'll proceed to vote. All in favor, raise your hand. This is uh, on page five, line eight. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four. All those in opposition, please raise your hand. I see one, two, three, four in opposition. So that amendment passes. Representative Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to pass something along, I just received a call from Representative Jennings and he's having severe internet problems. So um, he cannot hear anything. I just wanted the, uh, the chairman to know that. And uh, clearly uh, he was telling me he will, it's difficult for him to vote on something when he can't hear okay. what's happening with the amendments. So I pass that along, sir. Okay, thank you, Representative. Any other amendments to the bill on bidding? Anything else? Any other general discussion on the bill? Are we ready to vote? Is there a call for the question? Question. Question has been called for. Uh, Madam Secretary, will you call the roll? Mr. Chairman, this is a roll on vote of 21 LSO 221 version 5 as amended. Senator Anselmi vote. Aye. Senator Bonner. Aye. Senator Cross. Aye. Senator Bonner. Aye. Senator Burlingame. Aye. Representative Gray. Aye. Aye. Thank you. So, uh, draft 0221 on public works contracting requirements amendments passes. That brings us to the lunch break for the first time in the history of baseball. We are on time on day one of one of these meetings. So, that should be encouraging. I think we can take the full hour and reconvene again at 1 30 and take up ethics and disclosure. So, we'll see you again at 1 uh, 30 p.m.